Welcome to Fire Breathing Kittens, a standalone Dungeons and Dragons podcast. Every episode is a separate, complete adventure, so you can listen to them in any order. We are joined today by Dr. Crud the Third. Good morrow. I am a Loxodon. Used to be a cleric, but I am now an actual good forsaken doctor. We found uh, a, a a class to to change to. So he is now an actual doctor. He has no more magic whatsoever. Um, he stands at eight feet tall, five feet wide, 300 pounds. He wears blue jeans, a white shirt, button down shirt with a red tie. And his white lab coat is now not inlaid with chain mail. It is now white leather. He also has a tiny drone construct that's orbiting him. Cade Ghostbane. Cade is a half elf, a half elf with long red hair and red eyes. He's got fair skin as his elf half is Shader Kai. He used to be a holy paladin of Torm, but after a quite harrowing event, he has uh, become a bit to the darker side and um, has some, uh, we'll say, stability issues. And what level are you? He is a level seven, two levels in Paladin, and five levels in Warlock. Nice. And the beautiful Mocha. Hi, I'm Mocha. It's been a while since I've joined the Fire Breathing Kittens adventure. I have long silver hair and amber yellow eyes. I'm wearing a very flowy white dress. I am an asthma cleric, level seven. I enjoy healing people and saving people's lives, even though they might be enemies sometimes. And I'm glad to be playing today. Yay! And for the listener, this is the same plot as Have Your Goat and Eat It, but as you'll know from that episode, it was a huge world that they didn't explore all of, so we're going to see what fun, different aspects of the world this group explores, and how interesting it is that different people will enjoy different parts and gravitate towards different things, so you're going to see more of the story. All right. Um, also, before we start, I just want to apologize to everyone because I'm practicing accents today. A big part of Dungeons & Dragons is that the DM is supposed to be able to do voices, and I really can't, but the only way to get better is to practice, right? Right. So my apologies that I'm practicing today, and I'm going to stop apologizing so much during the episode, because that also annoyed people. <laughs> so you get uh, one blanket apology. <laughs> I'll, I'll blanket apologize that I'm blind today as well, so. Yeah, <laughs> literally. We'll be fine. Okay. Alrighty, let's get into it. What day of the week is it in game, party? You, the party, can decide. It's Wednesday. Sounds good to me. Sounds good. Wednesday. I wrote it down. So you can penalize for us for it later. No, I don't like to penalize people. That's just going to determine... Like I said, it's a modular story, so it <laughs> changes based on... Oh, that's a funny one. All right. <clears throat> Got it. And now... Also, where would you like to start today? Will you begin your adventure in yesterday's, a restaurant slash bar where you can sit and drink with friends? Or in Puppify, a dog kennel slash shelter where you can pet puppies? Or in Lasum Wood, a forest just north of the city of Nikimui, where monstrous creatures stalk their prey? So just to summarize, that's yesterday's, the restaurant slash bar, Puppify, the dog kennel slash shelter, or in Lasum Woods, a forest with monsters. The forest with monsters, please. Sounds good. Okay. Alrighty. I'm gonna flip to it. Bird song. Dappled light filtering down through leaves. The crunch of leaves underfoot. This is a fairly standard patch of Lasum Woods north of Nikimui. Perception check? And then also, for Cade's player, would you like for one of us to roll the dice for you because you can't see today? Um, give me one second. Let me see how bad this is. Okay. Oh, God. Yes, please. I rolled a six. Okay. And then will Dr. Crud the Third's player generate a d20 number? Uh, okay. Uh, he got a two. Okay. And then Cade's player, are you able to see your modifiers or would you uh, like us to I, I am it? not able to see the die at all. Okay. Or the, the character sheet modifiers? 
All the character sheet modifiers I can see. Okay, yeah, so we'll just, we will do your dice. And so, Crowd's player says that you rolled a two. I rolled a two. Um, and my modifier is two. Okay, so you got a four on perception. And Mocha, you got? A six total. Okay, and Dr. Crowd the third? I got a uh, 14. All right, one of you is perceptive and two of you are unaware. Dr. Crud the third, you are the only one who hears as a branch snaps. Yeah, 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 yeah y'all hear that? There, that, that was a, there's something out here. I didn't hear anything. Where? Are you sure? Yeah, I heard something go snippity snap. Which direction? That way. I don't see anything over there. Which, which, which way is that way? <laughs> can, you, can you please point? As all of you are are looking in that direction, all of you now, with your attention on that spot, hear a grunting, a squeal, and many animal feet charging at you across the leafy ground. Everyone, please roll initiative. Stampede! Fifteen. Okay, Kane got... I love that you're the one doing the southern accent. <laughs> Kane got a four... And, oh, yeah, all my modifiers have changed. I'm not in the negative for that anymore, I don't think. I rolled a five. Uh, where is it? Ooh, I have physical dice. I'll be right back. Fourteen for Dr. Crud. Holy crap. He's He's got a plus two instead of a minus one now. Ooh, doctors. And, Mocha, your number was? Fifteen. Okay. And then Kate is getting physical dice. He is. He's got them, and they're jumbo size, which is amazing. Yay! 17 plus 1, so 18. Perfect. Sorry, editor, you're going to hear a uh, physical die. That's okay. I actually like the sound of the die. Right? Yeah, and it's important, mm -hmm. listener, to in incorporate people. Regardless of disabilities, you should be accommodating and nice to one another. That is kind of the point, right? Yay. Be nice to one another in life. Because, you know, you all, like that ramp that they build outside of buildings for people with wheelchairs, you all need a wheelchair at some point in your life, right? Be happy for that ramp. Been there, done that. Been there, done that. Me too. All right. So that means that Cade goes first. Cade, you hear grunting, a squeal, and many animal feet charging at you across the leafy ground. How do you react? I... Go ahead and cast a green flame blade on my weapon, and I unsheathe my weapon. And so, as a hexblade warlock, I can form my weapon into whatever I want it to be as far as a normal martial weapon. Um, and so I make it into a big great axe. Wow. In one hand, and it just glows with this eldritch green glow. And I uh, then cast a green flame blade on it. Nice. Is that the end of your turn? Um... Yes. Well, actually, I uh, also oh. move forward to whatever is oncoming. All right. You are now, your movement speed, probably 30 feet in front of the party. Yes. Excellent. Next up is Mocha. I um, try to look for a very wide tree to hide behind in case the stampede tramples over me. And at the same time, I want to look beyond the stampede and see if they are running away from something or maybe in front of the stampede, see if they're running to something. I guess I'll look behind to see if they're running away from something. Excellent. So because you're paying extra close attention to them, you see what they are. You can see 100 feet away from you and 70 feet away from Cade are a group of deer pigs. They are kind of like pigs and kind of like deer. They've got tusks growing from their lower canines and from midway down their snout, protruding upwards and curling backwards into their eyes. All four of these tusks are white, but like dirty. And they're, and you've never seen an animal with tusks growing up through its the upper roof of its mouth before and curling back into its eyes. So it's a little terrifying. Um, and that is what is charging at you. Mocha, you see that, and you're 100 feet from them. You're also behind a tree, so they're less likely to see you. I'm going to give you half cover, or three-quarters cover. How's that? Okay. 
which means that you have an AC bonus of plus five. Don't quote me, but I think that's it. You can look it up. Yeah, you have three quarters cover. Is that the end of your turn? Yes. Well, I, I ready my bow. <laughs> I guess. <laughs> you ready your bow? Oh, so you're going to shoot them when they get closer to you? No, if I see an actual threat, I don't believe these steer pigs are threats. They seem to, if they move together, they tend to be more herd-like animals. And I, I, I have a feeling that they're running away from something more dangerous. So I will ready my bow for something dangerous, not deer pigs, poor pigs. <laughs> Got it. I like this. I like this open-minded approach. Yes. Dr. Crud the third. Now round to you. You're a hundred feet away from the group of animals that is rushing at you. You don't yet know what they are because you haven't like scoped them out like Mocha has. Well, Dr. Crud recognizes the sound of a stampede. So what he's going to do is he's going to, he's not suicidal. So he's going to, you know, get some height. So he's going to scramble on top of his carriage. Oh, the carriage. <laughs> okay. You are on top of your carriage. Everybody, that carriage has an extra dimensional space in it that has a full hospital. Mm-hmm. Oh, All wow. Right. Very nice. <laughs> well, aren't you handy to have around? Are there staff inside, too? Yeah, there is staff, but since I don't longer have spell slots, the magic in it is gone. Ah, <laughs> excellent. <laughs> DM well, hates carriage. <laughs> DM's the one that came up with the rules of the carriage. <laughs> I'm dumb sometimes. <laughs> you are now on top of your carriage. The deer pigs, which are called Babirusa, but only Mocha knows that, run towards you. They are able to close a distance. Let's see, they can move 70 feet closer to you. Oh, wow. So that means that they can close with Cade. Cade is down to zero. Mocha, you're 30 feet from them, and Crud, you're 30 feet from them. But because they ran at you, they're not able to attack this turn. They used their action to move a second 35 feet. So that occupies their entire turn, but now they're close enough for all of you to see that some of them have those tusk things growing through their upper snout and pointing, curling backwards towards their eyes, but the largest of them, which are quite large, we're talking like an eight foot long pig, hundreds of pounds, um, and with their teeth, actually you're seeing those teeth don't look like they're uh, just vegetarian, shall we say. Um, so the largest of them don't have the tusk things. And uh, if you guys want to roll a nature check, you're allowed to, and I'll tell you more information. But for now, I'll leave it at that. We're back to Cade. Yes, I would I would like to roll a nature check for more info. And that will be a... Oof. Um, I'm sorry. It will be a nine. Nine. Okay. A, a nine is below ten, so I'll give you partial information. You would say that this looks like a matriarchal group of animals. Much like orca whales, they can be both herbivorous and carnivorous. All right. That's your partial nature information. All right. So for, so they're, um, you said they closed the distance with me. How many are yes. within my distance as far as, you know, is there one within melee reach? Are they all within melee reach? What's the verdict on that? They are all within melee reach of you. And there are <laughs> six of them. Oh, great. Okay. Um, run to the carriage. Run to the carriage. Yeah, that'll give all six of them attack of opportunity. So, <laughs> no on that. Um, to heck with it. I've already cast Green Flame Blade. I will take a swing at the largest one, which I believe is the, I'm going to assume, is the Matriarch. Does a 16 hit. Yes. All right. Let me roll for damage. Um, would someone mind reading me the damage for a great axe being wielded one-handed? I'm pretty sure it's a D6. I'm just trying to find my D6 and my blindness is not helping. No worries. Yeah. Okay, here it is. It's a D12. If it's being wielded one-handed? Oh, that's two-handed. Yeah. Got it. Hold on. It's either a D6 or a D8. I don't see it immediately, so let's go with a D8. Okay. Um, let's see. One-handed. So six damage plus the damage from Green Flame Blade, which is an additional D8. So that's five. 
fire and then the flames from my blade not only hit the uh, initial target but they leap to one um they leap from the target to a different creature of my choice within five feet of it so i'll just choose the uh i guess the next largest and they will take um the second creature takes fire damage equal to my spell casting ability modifier which is six plus they take an additional um 1d8 to the initial target so that's an additional four damage to the initial target oh and then the uh, extra creature takes an additional 1d8 so the second creature takes an additional four damage so 10 total to the second creature right did i get uh, that right yeah i think so okay it looks very singed so it was 10 damage to the first one yeah i believe so i believe that was 10 damage a piece got it the matriarch looks slashed by your great axe and they both look singed they squeal pig squeals and with deep grunts too and also Everybody who is within 30 feet, which is indeed Mocha behind her tree and crud on top of his carriage. This is called Aura of Retribution. Every time a Babirusa takes any amount of damage, any creature that isn't a demon within 30 feet of the Babirusa must make a constitution saving throw. Everybody, please make a constitution saving throw if you're not a demon. Oh, DM, I'm sorry. DM, I'm sorry. The, uh, the oh. second creature... Also takes an additional six from my additional uh, modifier. With a squeal of pain, it goes down in flames and does not rise. So constitution rolls from everybody. All right. 14. Ooh. This mountain. The, the reason why you couldn't find a second damage die for one-handed is because it is a two-handed weapon. It cannot be used one-handed. Oh. Eh, we're going to hand wave that this yeah. time. In the future, you know that now. Yes. Right. Yeah. Sorry. There's, I, there's another axe. Is it a battle axe? They can be wielded one-handed and two-handed? Yes. Okay, so that's my bad. I meant to say battle axe. I think so. Um, My constitution rolls a 14. Okay. Mine is a 16, and my drones is an 18. Everybody passes. That means that... You guys take half of 25, which is rounding down 12. Ouch. So everybody, please take 12 damage. This damage has no type resistance, and immunity has no effect against it. Well, there goes my drone. Um, unless you are a demon, and then you do not take any damage. Is anybody here a demon? No, I was going to be. I don't think any of us are demons. And if you are, I'm not working with you anymore because I'm an angel. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, battle axe is what I intended to say. That's my bad. Don't worry about it. Okay, so Cade, did you take 12 damage? I did. It's not looking great. Is that the end of your turn? The only thing I have left to do is move. And I don't really... Oh no, I have bonus actions. But I don't believe any of my bonus actions are going to help me. So, yes, I'm not about to get five attacks of opportunity on me. Yeah, I'm going to stand and fight. Bring it, piggies. <laughs> Mocha, it's your turn. You're currently behind a tree with three quarters cover, and you're 30 feet away from the closest pig. I want to use some sort of insight or animal handling check to see if um, the deer pigs were stampeding towards us to attack us or if they were stampeding towards us away from something. Uh, like basically I want to assess the aggression of these deer pigs. Uh, aggression or if they're feared. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, do I roll, do you want me to roll insight or animal handling for this? You can choose. Those are good uses of those skills. Okay. Uh, 14. With your high roll, you can tell that these pigs look hungry and that this is probably a hunting party. Also, <sighs> because you're an angel, you're able to feel a demonic presence from them. You think that these creatures, and uh, just to remind everybody, demons are chaotic, devils are lawful. You think that these creatures are chaotic demons that enjoy 
running towards things and ripping them apart. And I do want to point out to the listener, pigs are carnivores. If you give them the opportunity, they're omnivores if they have to be. They can definitely eat an entire human body. So be a little bit more afraid of pigs than you currently are, my listener. So so these pigs, these demon pigs, they like the uh, caloric density of your body, Mocha. Oh, no. Um, Can I shoot my bow at them now? (laughs) Absolutely. You had a readied action, so this is before your turn even happens. Okay. I will hit at the one that Cade uh, swung at first, the largest one. Yes. And I rolled an eight to hit. You miss her. Your arrow flies through the air and between her little piggy ears, keeps going and disappears into the foliage behind her. Oh shucks. He just uh, briefly looks back and like, what are you shooting at? This thing is huge. How did you miss? I'm sorry, I haven't used this bow in a really long time. And now it's your normal turn. Um, I'll shoot again. Uh, 14. That hits. Your arrow, having missed... A little bit too high before, you lower your aim just by the tiniest bit, and your arrow thunks into the pig's head. How much damage Uh, do you do? One. It actually just hurt its ear, probably. (laughs) (laughs) A a little bit better. Oh my. Okay. Um, Everybody within 30 feet of Mama Pig, please do a constitution saving roll. I don't like this. This this is going to murder us. Yeah, it really is. I'm like (laughs) blowing on my die, like, come on, come on, come on. 11? Yes! I got a dirty 20. Three. Wow. The dirty 20 rolled by Cade means you take zero damage, but for 11 and 3, Mocha and Dr. Crud, you take one damage. That wasn't as bad as last time. The full amount of damage that the pig took. The Bobby Rusa. Oh. oh. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Is that the end of your turn, Mocha? Yes. Dr. Crud III, you're standing on top of your carriage, 30 feet away from the pigs, where Cade Ghostbane is melee engaging the uh, five surviving pigs, while Mocha hides behind a tree. <laughs> oh, actually, can I move to the tree next to me? Like, I guess to um, slightly more to the left, not away from like away from the pigs but slightly to the left so that i'm am ex- approximately 35 feet away from the pigs and outside of the range <laughs> yes yes you can thank you thank you and listeners that's because you have an action and a movement on each turn so she f- uh, fired her bow and then moved outside of the aura of retribution very wise <laughs> crud correction she's 35 feet from the pigs <laughs> that's good that's very good how far am i away 30 30 on okay. top of a carriage. What I would like to do is I would like to uh, throw my portable hole onto the ground in front of me and lure the pigs into it. So how, how what kind of role should I get to attract them? Animal handling. Animal handling. Hey, I got positive in that. That is going to be a natural 20 with a 1. 21. <laughs> nice. Describe how you're luring pigs into this hole. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, Dr. Crud uh, uh, grabs it out of his pocket, throws it onto the ground in front of him, and then just sh- starts shouting, Sui! Sui! <laughs> <laughs> They're excited and enraged, and in their animal minds, this is a summons that they can't refuse. <laughs> 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 the... Five surviving Babirusa run into the hole. And how deep is that hole? It is. I actually pulled it up so I could see. It is, I believe, 10 feet. Yep, 10 feet deep. They take a D6 of falling damage as they nice. <laughs> run into the hole. Now, I do want to say, I hope this doesn't kill Dr. Crud III. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to total up how much damage was collectively taken. Wait, why would it kill him? Because I'm less than 30 feet away from them. Oh. That is 12 damage. And Cade, you're also 30 feet away from this hole. Unless, let's, uh, well, they have 35 feet of movement. So, Dr. Crud, if you want to throw it 
they only have 30 feet of movement. Oh, no. So you have to throw it exactly 30 feet away for them to be able yeah. to reach it. So, yeah, Cade, you have to take this damage. Um, okay, so that is 12 damage uh, across the piggies from falling into the hole. Cade and Dr. Crud, please make a constitution saving throw. I got a dirty 20. You take Ooh. six damage. And Cade? Uh, hang on. I, I got over 20. I got 21. You take six damage. Both half damages because you passed your saving throw. So now the pigs are all in the portable hole. Dr. Crud jumps down and closes it up. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Please describe what happens to creatures in the portable hole when it's closed. They will suffocate after uh, da, 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 10 minutes. 10 minute timer on the clock. Aren't you a pacifist? <laughs> He's got to eat, doesn't he? Yeah. The animals don't count. Oh. <laughs> All right. Well, everybody, I guess that ends the battle. Mocha, you are 35 feet away behind a tree. Cade, uh, the pigs ran away from you. I guess technically they got opportunity attacks, but I assumed that you wouldn't want to hurt yourself by hitting them. Uh, and then, Crud, you're carrying a pocket full of pig. <laughs> I sure am. <laughs> Where did all the pigs go? They're in my pocket. I'm going to have a lot of bacon here in, in about 10 minutes. <laughs> cool. It won't escape, right? Nope. But they won't escape? Okay, good. I guess we can continue onward through the forest. Can uh, I, I come like uh, Cade walks over to the carriage, like holding his uh, left arm a little bit. And, like Limping over. So, um, yeah. Doctor, Doc, you got a little something for me? I greatly appreciate it. You, you say this, it, it, as you look at him, you, you can see blood just coming out of his nose and his eyes and his ears. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I kind of got screwed up quite a bit with that as myself. Uh, I'm just looking at my... That's all right, bud. Uh, I'll, I'll just ask the little ones over here for help. Y'all mind, mind giving me a little, a little heal? Little lay on hands, maybe. What I'm saying is, I, I can help us both. But uh, oh. if you want Mocha to go ahead, then that's, I mean, that's completely up to you. No, if you can help us both, I'm all for it. I'm just saying, well, I got go lay on hands myself. Well, let's get in the carriage. I got some uh, some health potions that uh, I brewed oh. up this morning. All right, sounds and good to me. I, I I practically leap into the carriage. And uh, he hands each. Mocha, do you want one as well? Sure. All right. So everybody gets a potion of greater healing. It's 44 plus four. Oh. I will po pocket that potion <laughs> because I am an angel and I can just glow as an action and just heal myself. Yeah, you said 44 <laughs> plus four? Right. Um... As Dr. Crud sees her pocket it, he tells her, all right, well, just so you know, at the end of the day, that becomes vinegar again. It will be absolutely worthless. So, oh, I like the taste of vinegar. Um, upon hearing it will turn into vinegar, uh, Kate immediately just downs the entire thing. I shrug because I like the taste of vinegar and wouldn't mind if it doesn't heal. Alrighty. Hopefully we won't need it later. Kay just looks at uh, Mocha and raises an eyebrow like, teach his own. Or her own. It will last until the end of the day, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, we. I might need it later. Or it could be vinegar. Alright, well, shall we proceed on now that we've got a pocket full of bacon? Well, yeah, Where where do we want to go? Looking around you in the Lassoom woods, you see a town off in the distance, and you also see a vertical white tower, a magical tower, a spire rising to the heavens. The town contains a variety of things, such as Puppify, the dog kennel, and shelter, and yesterday's, an inn, and restaurant, and bar. <laughs> hey, uh... I think they got a bar up, up in that town right there. Y'all um, reckon we should head that way? Yeah, maybe they can cook up my bacon. Yeah, 
Um, so as the uh, as you say, they Mike can cook up to your bacon. Cade looks to um, his left shoulder where there's seemingly nobody behind him and says, "I don't know. The pelts are probably worth something. We'll figure it out when we get there." Ah, uh, did you hit your head? What? No, um, no, they just hit me in the chest. I'm I'm good. Potion uh, really did a number on me. Thanks, appreciate it. Okay, then. Dr. Cred's going to ignore the uh, possible psychosis going on. All right, well, let's uh, let's go ahead and file out and get get uh, into the driving part of the carriage and uh, head towards uh, head towards your pub there. And as we get out, we hear some cracking starting from my incubator. What uh, what you got back there? Oh, did you hear that? Did you hear? Oh, my egg. Oh, it has been a year. My egg's about to hatch. I laid it a year ago. I got bacon and eggs. No, no, it's hatching. We we we, we don't eat the baby. What egg? The, what baby? Right, you see my incubator right there? That that big big white one with the green polka dots? Where you laid it? Yeah, uh uh But biologically? Yeah, I, I drank a potion. And all of a sudden, I had an urge to go. I went to a bush, <laughs> and uh, I gave birth to this egg. And I've had it in the incubator ever since, and it sounds like it's hatching. That uh sounds painful. I'm guessing it's a good thing you're a doc. It was very confusing. I <laughs> don't think it was very painful. There was a lot of relief afterwards. I rush over to the incubator because I'm very excited that an egg is hatching and I, I observed each and every crack of the egg and out pops out a little itty bitty trunk coming through one of the spaces that uh, were uh, of, of one of the cracks and it fall a, a huh? trunk yeah huh. like an elephant trunk yep and it comes out the, the the rest of the shell falls away and there is a cross between a dragon and a elephant. <laughs> how how cute that's what you say to every baby no matter what <laughs> oh my god I'm a mommy Dr. Cred runs over and grabs it and starts just holding it and, and hugging on it look guys I'm a mommy <laughs> yeah Kate again turns congratulations. back congratulations <laughs> yeah mazel tov well, Kate uh oh. Again, turns behind him and says, "Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm glad we didn't eat that. That's, I don't think that would have tasted great." <laughs> He's kind of like mumbles it to him, seemingly to himself. Uh, Doctor Crow's not going to hear anything right now. He is so in love with his little, his little baby. Oh my God! What have I got to call you? What, what, what am I going to name you? Oh, let me check something. Yep, you're a girl. Oh, what am I going to call you? What am I got? Oh, I know. You're a Jenny, ain't you? Yeah. This is my little Sue. Yeah. This is my little Jenny. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, congratulations, and I, I welcome Jenny to this world. <laughs> Hello, Jenny. So, Dr. Crud will grab a, uh, a, a baby Bjorn that he had prepared earlier because he, he knew it was coming, and he puts it on. It's very big because, you know, elephant. And then he puts the baby right in there. And all right, let's go to the tavern. We got a lot to celebrate now. So, uh, Doc, I have a I have a I have a question. Um, not not to be not to be intrusive. You know, I, I respect your privacy and whatnot. But I do notice the, the baby's half uh, ha ha half elephant. And also yeah. half dragon, or seemingly dragon. I, I, I'm just kind of assuming because, you know, a few lizard features. Um, do do you mind? Yeah, you mean the wing? Yeah, I mean the one wing, and the, and the tail. What wings? There's two of them. Oh, oh, oh! I'm sorry, I didn't see the other one because of the ears. <laughs> um, I just kind of assumed it was yeah. two sets of wings, but I guess those are ears. Um, and the scales, and and the the. the are those are those teeth? Please, are those teeth? Matter of fact, I do have a picture of it that I can send once I find out where I saved it. 
Well, like my question um, is, um, how how long ago was it you laid this egg? About a year. Uh, it was a year ago. So, uh, huh? Around did did maybe about nine months or so before you laid the egg? Do you did you have a you know a real good <laughs> night out on the town? Maybe just just a little curious if maybe there was a. You know, just just not judging. You know, they teach teach their own. But well, I mean, I always have a good time, <laughs> no matter where I go. I, I can t- I can tell, I can tell. I'm just I'm just curious. But, you know, just just uh, medically curious. I'm sure you can understand. You know how uh, one comes to half half elephant and uh, half half dragon. How that um how the physiology of all that kind of uh works out well it has a lot to do with the whole uh potion that i drank you see what happened was that the the potions were a bit uh screwy and we had to go figure out why it was screwy did uh did did the potion maybe come out of a uh, maybe come out of a keg and you drank quite a lot of it i'm just curious just just asking just asking no, it was made by goblins who were enslaving a uh, potion maker. Oh. All right. Well, like I said, teach his own. Well, so I, um, just I, I sent welcome a... little, little Jenny into this world. That's, you know, she's very cute. So I sent everybody the, the picture, and I will describe it for the audience. It is a gray... uh animal with four legs, a long tail, two wings, an elephant head, a scaly dragon body type thing with uh, tusks and two horns on the top and beautiful brown eyes. (laughs) And listeners, that is the episode Mythical Dilemmas. If you'd like to know how Jenny was born, well, the created. Created. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) You guys arrive yesterday's. Walking in through the front doors, you find yesterday's to be a large room with wooden walls, a bar counter, and a sitting area with wooden tables and chairs. Behind the bar counter, one swinging half door leads to the kitchens, and a second wooden door has a sign on it that informs you there is a second floor with rooms for rent. One gold per room per night. Two people other than yourselves are in this restaurant right now. A waitress in her fifties who has a dragon's body and angel wings, and an elf. The elf is sitting at a table eating a steaming hot fajita goat and cactus platter. The waitress is behind the bar and seems distracted. She hasn't noticed you, instead looking at a pad of paper in her hands. The room is a bit dark, with the primary source of light being sunlight shining in through cloth shades on the big front window. Dr. Crud comes in and yells out, I'm a mama, let's celebrate. Kay just turns around and, uh, like, again, at seemingly no one says, uh, yeah, just, just go with it. Just, just, just go with it. It's okay. The waitress looks up from her pad of papers and, not recognizing you, but liking your mood, uh, smiles and says, congratulations, and comes out from behind the bar. The elf eating their goat and cactus fajitas also does a a little tiny applause. Yay! Thank you, thank you, thank you. Drinks all around. And I have five piggies. Can you uh, fry them up? Would they be good and suffocated? Oh, it's. I'm sure it's well past ten minutes. Okay. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, uh, the waitress will head back and talk to the chef and um, it's going to be a few minutes while they're back there negotiating prices and figuring out stocks and I think isn't a whole pig like valuable like isn't that like a $200 item usually in real life probably um, I mean depends. I can google it so it, it really depends on where you are and the size of the pig and the condition of it after capture or you know after it's deceased but yeah, okay. two hundred dollars would be, I, I would say between one and two ish. Okay, so since it's street meat, let's go on the lower half of that and say one hundred gold per pig, and you have five pigs, so that's five hundred gold. Well, not to be snarky, but wouldn't the larger one be worth a little more? Sure, five hundred and fifty <laughs> gold. 
uh, I'm, I'm, are they charging us 550 or are they? They're buying the ah, pigs okay. off of you. If, Sold. I, I assume. Okay. <laughs> Sold. 550. All right. As he's doing that exchange, um, Cade walks up to the bar and immediately just buys an entire keg. Like if he can, is there like a uh, like a smaller, you know, somewhat portable size keg around? Because I would like to buy it for my doctor friend as a celebratory uh, gift. Sure, and it looks like a keg. Now there's I'm seeing different prices here, but a keg is like a hundred and fifty dollars online. That can't be right. It'd be that a, is a, it'd be a keg. smaller keg, not it would be one that you could, you know, reasonably like, carry with two hands if you're a decently strong individual. Not like the massive barrel. A five gallon keg then? I'm sure. seeing yeah. different sizes. Five gallon. Sounds great. Okay. Like eighty gold I can do that. I don't know. Okay. That's that's eighty dollars would be the real life. Yeah. Number, that, that's yeah. Perfectly fine. So I, uh, I. So I think that's like ten gold. Then I don't remember. I think it's a one to ten conversion of like one gold is ten dollars. Okay, wait. So that's fifty five gold, Doctor Crud, and it's ten gold for the keg. Because I forgot about the one to ten conversion from dollars okay. to gold. Perfectly fine. I, uh, I just haul this. Uh, Rather large keg, kind of half dragging it, half carrying it over to my uh, Loxodon friend, and just pat it on the top and say, "Congrats! This is uh, this is all you, bud." Drinks all around, everybody. Party! <laughs> Except none for little Jenny. <laughs> <laughs> Let's all get drunk around this baby. <laughs> <laughs> Mocha, what are you up to? Um, after the waitress is done talking to the chef and all. I would like to order a gin and tonic without the tonic. <laughs> so just straight gin. <laughs> okay, that'll be one gold. And you notice that she looks distracted, fiddling with a pad of paper in her hand and worried. Um, what's wrong, Miss Waitress? Her name tag says Robin. What's wrong, Robin? Oh, dearies, I apologize. I will have your gin out in just a moment. My apologies. I didn't want to bother you with this. It's just... Just what? I normally take food to my husband's aunt every day before my shift. Today, I went to drop it off and she wasn't there. Technically, she has every right to go outside, but she's just a little old lady and she's not always all there. She's nearly always inside her home. I wonder if she'll have returned by the time I get off work. Her name is Tinatin, and she's a dear, but she's a bit forgetful. If you would like, we can go check out your husband's aunt, T Tinatin, to see if she's all right. Could you? That would be wonderful. My shift ends in an hour about when you guys would be done drinking here. I would, I could take you to her residence. That would be lovely. Aw, she's really worried and really grateful that you're helping her out. Yeah, I'll, I'll console her and hug her and be like, she'll be all right. Aww. Do uh, Cade, do, do we hear, overhear this or is it just Mocha and the, the waitress? How loud are you talking, Mocha? Probably loud enough since the place is relatively empty. I'm sure they can hear us from 10, 20 feet away. Uh, how do you feel, Doc? Should we uh, go help this poor lady out? Oh, wait, what? what? I'm sorry. I was playing with the baby and drinking. What, what's going on? <laughs> I think Mocha signed us up for a uh, little bit of an assistance. What do you think? She wants oh, to sure. uh, help this lady. I, I love helping people. I I, I got I, I'm feeling so good today. I I, I mean piggies and, and now I got a kid and, 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 and yeah. Are, are we are you gonna be all right trying to uh, transport little Jenny here? He points at the 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 baby Bjorn. Oh yes. All right. Well, if y'all are down, <laughs> I'm down too. All right. Happy to help. I'm I'm good and, and uh, slightly tipsy, so I'm we're we're we are happy to help. That's a good point. Uh, so if we're drinking this keg in, in one hour, what are we? How are we looking? 
after five gallons in one hour. Like you left some beer for other people. You, you said you said drinks all around, but the, so the other two people here are participating Actually, as well. You know, if, yeah, if you're, I mean, do you want me to bring in some more of the town members? Because that, that would attract them. Do you want me to introduce you to another of the town's NPCs, though? Because, like, if they wander in and there's drinks, like, do you want that? It's up to you. I'm, I'm down. Sure. Okay. Do you want me to bring in... I'll, I'll get that list of characters here. Nah, surprises. H- how many are there? And roll a, a die accordingly. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that works, yeah. too. <laughs> yeah, here. Got it. Oh, I have a good idea. Okay. Um... Yeah, this is who would be stopping by a bar. Okay. The drunkard. A human in his late teens or early 20s walks into the bar. Welcome. We're celebrating today. Baby Jenny was born just an hour ago. <laughs> it's so exciting. Hey, We have lots of drink. we <laughs> all, Drinks all around. Come on in. We're all friends. Nah, nah, friends nah. here. Now. Nah. Now, are you are you old enough to be drinking here? Oh, you know what? I'm just kidding. Go ahead, grab some. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's say he's 21. There we go. <laughs> just writing that down. <laughs> he's 21 on his ID. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> there are other places that you that the drinking age is as low as 16. So I mean, this could be one place. Yeah, he's yeah he's good. <laughs> so uh, he. Is delighted that he came into yesterday's today. It is, and the look on his face is he's like, "Wow, I'm glad I came here." And uh, uh, did I have an accent for him? Yeah, he has like a a low voice. You know, he's got a cold. Um, he's like, "Ah, oh, this is this is the best day to come into yesterday's. Congratulations, Jenny!" And he does a toast. Well, is he, thank uh... you, thank you. You got you got to tell him how pretty she is. You gotta tell yeah, her. I, you I gotta was about start. to say, does he seem off put by Jenny at all? Oh, yeah, is he just like, ah, it's fine, it's whatever. <laughs> Let me roll for that. <laughs> he is human, so I don't know how he handles dragon babies. Uh yeah, he he he's very similar to Cade, but he can tell that you're an elephant and it's got an elephant trunk and he's like looking between you two. <laughs> it's like I mean, how I, I, I look at the picture, it's the cutest little thing in the world. <laughs> It is. And it's definitely part elephant. So like, mm-hmm. it's, it's, it's yours. It's your baby. Um, yeah. And, and he and Cade are going to, he's going to like wander over to Cade because Cade, what do you look like again? You're kind of elfy looking. Uh, yeah. Kind of elfy. I'm half elf, half human. I'm slightly pale skin, uh, red eyes, red hair. And you're around his age and same yeah, gender? Yeah, I'm, I'm around 30. And same okay. gender, and, yeah. And you say the baby looks funny. I mean, golly. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, only one person is human in here, so uh, Mocha looks pretty human, but prettier, right? Yes. Oh, yeah, no, he wouldn't talk to Mocha. That's terrifying. Um, Exactly. Pretty girl, no, run away. Yeah, so he's going to talk to Kate. We're all terrified of Mocha. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Why? Because you're too pretty. I'm so innocent. You're too pretty, and you're the only woman here that's not the waitress. So you're horrifying. the, The elf lady. Oh, that was a lady? I'm sorry. I, I didn't. I just heard the elf. I didn't know that was a lady. Yes. The, the waitress. The waitress. Yeah. Oh, um, my bad. Robin. Yes. I, I say except the waitress. <laughs> you said she's older. I assumed old, like elderly. Yeah. yeah. She she sounded old. Older. 50s. Yeah. Oh, okay. 50s ain't so bad. Uh, sorry if I made her voice too old. She's, I don't know. She's, her kids are grown. And out of the house. Now, I'm half elf. Kate likes dumb cougars. Yeah, I'm half elf, man. If, if, as long as you're under like a hundred, you're good. <laughs> She's noticeably not young. Some highway okay. miles. Anyway, so it's from the stress. <laughs> <laughs> you guys. <laughs> <laughs> it's from the waitressing. Yeah, all the okay. Um, so, so Maurizio introduces himself to you holding out a hand and saying i'm maurizio you to cade because you're the closest person to him and people flock to what they're like ah i um <clears throat> i give a slight bow and i'm said i said uh my name's cade ghost bane these are the little ones i uh, point behind myself and again there's there's nothing back there i said uh pleasure to meet you 
Pleasure to make your acquaintance. What brings you to yesterday's? Ah, uh, well, we just were out and about hunting and uh, decided to come in for a little drink. Just traveling with my two companions here and uh, we're just kind of out for a good time, honestly. I can tell. Thanks for the beer. That's great. Oh, no problem. Celebrating a, uh, a newborn baby. Thing. Baby. If only I wasn't on my way to work, I would totally drink a lot more. Man, I this is a big keg for like five people. Ah, uh, you say that, but he's a loxodon, so I, I imagine it won't take him uh, too long to go through that. I imagine that's like one for him, you know? Like one round. Yeah, it's probably already three quarters gone. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, then he's going to get a, a second one. And he's going to be like, ah, free beer, but work. I don't know. Hmm. I, well, I just, I work in a kennel. Like, I, don't, I can probably just drink a little bit. The dogs aren't going to care. I mean, My boss might. She has been in a mood lately. Oh, why is that? Well, and then like you guys are drinking and chatting. You've got an hour until the waitress gets off work. So you're just hanging. So you've got time. And he says, it all started when... She refused corporate's ruling to pay for renovations so we could also kennel cats. And then, Mocha, if you want to join the table, you can. Yeah, I'll, I'll grab my gin and I, I'll come to the table. Say cheers a few times. Oh, nice to meet you, Mocha. <laughs> nice to meet you, too. <laughs> what did you say your name was? Maurizio. Maurizio. All right. Nice hey. to meet you. And congratulations, Jenny. I'm being born. You little cutie. So cute. Anyway, so yeah, so like, she said, uh, she said since she was the franchiser, it was her decision, so she's fighting corporate. It is ridiculous. Like, Puppify Corporate did not like that. You know, they were like, you have to pay to expand to renovate so that, like, you can kennel cats, too. And, uh, there was something about, like, if we didn't renovate to take in cats by February, that they would build another temporary shop in the parking lot. I don't know. I'm sorry for not making a lot of sense. I'm a bit sleep deprived. This is my second shift um, in a row. I, I worked last night too, and I wasn't even supposed to come in today. So, so yeah, so there's a temporary, like, second Puppify in our parking lot right now. Like, <laughs> that one, it was built by corporate, and, like, they kennel cats there, and they're, they're suing us to take over our building. It is crazy at work. I don't know what's going to happen. Cat people, am I right? Come on. <laughs> uh, being very much a dog person, he fist bumps you. Exactly. Amen. Like, all day. Like, I, I fist I bump him and I like, put my arm around him and, like, do that little half guy hug, you know, or, like, pull him in. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I hiss at them. Dr. Crud looks at both of them very disapprovingly, seeing how his, uh, his best friend in the whole wild world and, uh, you know, uh, ch charge is a tabaxi. Oh yeah, and who's your best friend in all the world? Beans. Hey, you got the right name. Did uh, <laughs> do, do you say anything about that, or you just kind of look your look at us and shake your head? Uh, he looks at you the same way you've been looking at Jenny, with disgust. <laughs> I've been looking. I did not look at Jenny with disgust. <laughs> just mild confusion. Because I don't know how a loxodon and a dragon, you know, have a baby. It's, it's I'm not a doctor, you know. It's it's it's, it's new territory for me. Look, he explained. He drank a potion and an egg popped out. Yeah, it was yeah. an egg donor situation. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right, yeah, no, exactly. I, have, I did not look at Jenny with disgust. I think all babies are adorable. I was just confused. Okay. And thought well, about asking if we could disgust. charge people to come look at her. But I didn't say that. So, you know, she's adorable. Uh, yeah, he, he definitely looks at you with disgust. <laughs> <laughs> it's nothing against tabaxi. I just don't like cats. I love tabaxi people. I'm just... Cats just... They're, they're, they're not nice, man. They're, they're just... They're not nice. They're not any nice individuals. The elf across the bar gives you a stink eye and keeps eating her goat fajitas and then goes back up to her room. Oh, she's a cat person. <laughs> oh. I can just feel the hate. We're all cat people except for you. And and my buddy Maurice here. 
<laughs> who, since an hour has passed, is going to cheers to you. Two beers is probably his limit right before a shift. And especially since he's sleep deprived, you know, um, his coworker, he mentioned, hasn't come in. So he's covering for him because he's uh, he didn't call out or anything. He was just no showing the past few shifts. Oh, he says, uh, hey, man, thanks for thanks for the beer. And, you know, Jenny, I, I blessings on you for the best life, little girl. You're going to grow up big and strong. I'm going to go work my shift at the Puppify Kennel. And uh, hey, man. And he, he fist bumps both Cade and um, then like looks at Mocha, the cat lover, and is like, uh, and then like, he just kind of like leaves <laughs> awkwardly. <laughs> so, uh, okay. Well, never mind then. We, I was going to inquire as to his coworker not showing up, but it's fine. Oh, uh. Do you want me? I can. No, 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 no. I can tell you. No, no, we're good. Oh. We, we uh, okay. I, I, I assume that was something we would talk about during the hour of drunken humor, but I mean, it was probably just a, uh, it's no big deal. Yeah, I'll just give you some quick stats. His name's Ankit, and he is a quiet, creepy dude who doesn't talk much. And Maurizio told you that during the hour. He doesn't know much about him. He like lives by himself in an apartment complex and he gives you his address because he's been there. Um, not like inside it or anything, but he picked him up one time when he needed a ride. So you have that address. Okay. It is so, uh, 3901 Juanuco Road, um, apartment 29, because he picked him up and gave him a ride one time. Can we just pretend I uh, know that address because I can't see my handwriting? <laughs> At the yes. moment. Everybody, I, please I write down, down. 3901 okay. Juanuco Road, apartment 29 for Cade's player. Thank Excellent. You. My eyesight has decided to run away again. Oh, 29. I thought, okay. Good. I thought I I thought I heard 25, so that would have been awkward if we went to that one. <laughs> yeah, 29. So, <laughs> All right, so, yeah, Mauricio doesn't know where he went, and he's honestly like, he's like, uh, that guy makes me feel so awkward. Like, I don't... <laughs> So I kind of hope we just hire someone new. Uh, <laughs> was that kind of a, a conversation just between Maurice and I, or was everybody included in that? The whole table, yeah. Okay. So you all know that. So I'm going to look around. Kate looks around and says, so um, we're already going to help the waitress out to see uh, what's going on. Should we also maybe get a look for this guy just in case, you know, something, maybe he's not feeling well. It, it just seems a little off that he hasn't shown up for work in a few days. And I'd hate for, you know, something bad to be happening in for him uh, to him yes uh it seems like it's a um it might be related to related cases um if i think if we get to the bottom of this we'll probably find the both of them the two missing people plausible missing people uh, i like the way you think I i'm sorry what's going on i, I was playing the baby <laughs> people are missing we're gonna go help them oh okay all right. So Robin gets off her shift. She ties up her waitress apron and leaves it in her employee cubby place where she's supposed to. And now she, uh, you know, washes her hands and leaves work. So you guys have acquired one Robin. What is her name? Kitcher. She is a dragon body and angel wings who gets the best of both worlds. She's called a Tenryu. And uh, she is ready for you guys to go with her to check on her husband's aunt, Tinatin. So uh, she dries off her hands on uh, the apron, puts the apron back, you know, um, heads out from behind the bar and says, Thank you so much for going to check on her with me. I'm sure it's nothing, but you know, I... I can't help but worry about her. She's not all there. It's okay. I'm, I'm... If you keep worrying like that, you're going to get wrinkles. More wrinkles. <laughs> wow. <laughs> there, there. Meow. She touches her crow's nest, or what do you call that? The thing next to her eyes. Crow's, crow's feet? feet. <laughs> mm-hmm. Oh, there, there. Yeah, I've had those since I was like 12. <sighs> and Mocha wonders why. People are scared of her. Right? <laughs> Flashback to season one as she got more and more evil every episode. <laughs> well, so she touches her. It's her not crow's evil, feet. just my personality. <laughs> <laughs> so she touches her crow's feet and she says, You'll have those too, my dear. It happens with age. Thankfully, my husband. 
Anil loves me anyway. Dr. Crud steps between the two and, and, and is prepared to, 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 to stop the fight if it starts happening. It's actually a super condescending old happy person to young person thing going on. Hence why Dr. Crud just got between them. Yeah. Oh, no, you think Mocha's going to strike out? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> what? Gonna, like, a little lash at her. Okay. Mocha, how do you react? I, I don't notice. I don't notice what Crud is doing. I thought he was just uh, joining the party and we're going to head out to his, <laughs> uh, to Robin's husband's aunt's place. Keep thinking that. All right. So you guys head out. 3901 Juanico Road, the apartment complex. Oh, that's convenient. Wait, isn't this where Maurizio's co-worker Ankit lives too? Yep. It's, it's the same apartment complex. It's the largest apartment complex in town, so a lot of people live here. The apartments are a tall, square building with large windows that was built right on the banks of a rapidly flowing stream. The apartments are actually quite attractive. They look out across the rushing water at trees in the forest. A tall white tower is visible in the distance, and it's very picturesque. The colorful writing on a sign planted in the flower bed outside the building's front door says, Welcome home! Apartments available! See leasing office! We skip the leasing office, mm -hmm. um, because usually apartment complex, even if they're gated, they're pretty well open. Mm -hmm. um, and we head, we follow Robin straight to the apartment complex of her aunt-in-law. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. She takes you to apartment 22. She knocks on the door and she says, Tinatin! Tinatin, we're here to check on you. I, I tried to bring you food this morning and you weren't here. Knock, knock, knock. I, uh, I don't hear any response, y'all. I, um, do, uh, I'm sorry, miss. Do you have a key that we maybe could get in with? I, I wish I had a key and thinking back on it now about how old she is and how forgetful I am rethinking our family management plan for her in this very moment. I, I'm going to go to my own apartment and, um, I'm going to look to see if Anil has a key for her. You guys can come with me and I'll, I'll fix you something to eat. One second here. Let's, and she goes, she's in apartment 27. It's across the hallway, but really close by. And she opens the door upon a fairly standard looking family home. Um, and she's going past you to like rummage in a bowl with keys, just like checking. She's like, maybe Anil got one. Let me just double check here really quick. And she um, she reaches behind her and gets a plate of cookies that um, she just is going to set on the table. So there's a couch, a rug, and then there is a very particular, peculiar coffee table perception check sure <clears throat> Oof. 21 nice uh <laughs> 11 dr crud uh, is not going inside he actually uh looks down at jenny says all right watch mom watch mommy work and he kicks the door down oh my gosh okay so we're gonna get <laughs> to you for one second um mocha that you so Cade, you don't notice, so you can't respond. But Mocha, that's definitely a coffin is a coffee table. And <laughs> Dr. Crud. <laughs> it's absolutely a coffee table. Yeah. A coffin table. Coffin table. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, and so Dr. Crud the third, let's see your attack roll on the door. And I'm going to look up how many hit points a door has and how to break one down in D&D. &D. Yeah, I was going to ask if anyone knew how to pick a lock. Or if Robin was on the emergency contact card for the uh, Tinatin. And then if so, we can probably get a spare key from the leasing office. Yeah. <laughs> but sure, I kicked the door down. <laughs> Officially, wood doors have an AC of 15 and they have uh, hit points. Let's see. Well, this is complicated. It's going to... I love tables because I can just look at them, but it's going to make me read a paragraph. Hmm. 
I'm going to go with 50 hit points because screw that paragraph. All right. <laughs> oh, that's going to take a while. Yeah. All right. So 50 hit points and the AC that I said and then promptly forgot. Right. Uh, well, I hit it and I do one damage. Okay. And when you hit it, your giant elephant foot makes a huge sound and vibration. Jenny starts crying and everyone in the apartment complex <laughs> hears it. <laughs> so we're, we're going to go back to Mocha. The door isn't broken yet? <laughs> Oh, that noise. <laughs> it has 50 hit points. <laughs> it, he definitely can break it down. It's not impossible. Like, it's going to happen. It's just going to take... It's going to take a while. ...noise and time. Um, so, uh, we're back to Mocha. Mocha, she's... Uh, Robin is rummaging through the key bowl for some keys, has set some cookies on the coffin table, and has her back turned to you and is in the kitchen. And Cade is, I assume... What are you doing with those cookies, Kate? This is just normal cookies at a normal coffee table to you. Hey, sorry. My my uh, apologies. My GPU decided to update and I cut out for a minute. I missed that last part. Okay. You're just you're just eating cookies at the coffee table. What are you doing? Or, or do you eat the cookies? Um, can I do and uh so as part of Kate's background, he's very um Skeptical, <laughs> to, to say the least. So, uh, can I do a like an insight check or something to see if the cookies are safe to eat? Because he, he's not sure he trusts the uh, ladies cooking. Mm -hmm. Do you have? Um, first, I should ask if you have detect poison skills, because sometimes people have that. Like monks can do that. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Give me one moment. Let me use my good eye. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, I did, but I removed it, so I no longer have that. So no, I do not have Got detect it. poison. So then, please roll an investigation check. Investigation, come on, baby. Oh no, what's my bonus? <sighs> sorry, my uh, my one good eye is like half good. Uh, so it's plus. It's okay, and if you want us to roll your dice for you, we can. No, it's okay. I've got these giant die. I rolled a 12, I rolled a 13. I have a 13. Okay. A 13 is greater than 10, so you pass your check. And you crumble apart the cookie, breaking it up into, like, first you break it in half, you know, checking for razor blades, and then you break it into quarters. I guess you're looking for bug parts, and now you're crumbling it into pieces. And inside your, your left hand, your, I assume your right hand, you cup the crumbs of the cookie and can find no obvious malignancies in it. It is a crumbled chocolate chip cookie. Ooh. So he, I, um, Kay just uh, kind of like turns his hand into a little funnel and just, you know, <laughs> inhales the cookie dust. Oh, uh, it's like one of those Pepperidge Farm thick cookies. <clears throat> <laughs> so it, it, he, uh, he uses his hand like when you um you know when you uh, when you get a thing of fries and you only have like the crumbs of the fries in the bottom you just like kind of shake yeah. it he, he's just kind of like shaking bits. yeah exactly he's like shaking the cookie bits <laughs> down his throat and while he's doing that he um he uh he, he turns to behind him to uh, basically i'm guessing a blank wall and he's like no you can't have any sorry and and he just you know finishes off the uh the cookie crumbles Mocha, how do you react to that? You know that it's a coffin, not a coffee table. Um, I'm not sure what Robin's um, religious, uh, I guess, methods are. In some cultures, when cookies are left next to a coffin or um, for a picture of someone who's passed away, it's for them in their afterlife. So um, before I uh, cause too much commotion, I ask Robin uh, about the coffin. Yeah. I go, this looks like a coffin. May I ask whom's or whose or why? <laughs> <laughs> she, she turns around from where she's rummaging in the bowl with the keys um, and we're about to have crud kick the door, by the way, but before, <laughs> don't worry, we haven't forgotten. <laughs> and, and replies, oh, yes, that's for me one day. 
My church has all of its members by their coffin before we pass, and my husband's is in the bedroom closet. Mine didn't fit, so we use it as the coffee table. I see. And Mocha, that was very insightful of you. You you hit the nail on the head. Very clever. <laughs> um, I, I see. I, I guess the church likes making money <laughs> up from people, and... If you're dead, they might not be able to get the payment afterwards. So it's good that you guys made a like was a prepaid your coffin, <laughs> pre-purchased your coffin. Oh, I, but I don't say that. Obviously, that's just uh, in my head. I say very nice design. Um, it looks very a very comfortable coffin for you one day. It looks nice and cozy. That is so sweet. She's gonna give you extra cookies. <laughs> and. And just as she's realizing that she definitely does not own a key and is rethinking that choice, um, and her husband is at work delivering mail, uh, so boom, you all hear an elephant foot (laughs) thudding into a door, doing definite damage to it. (laughs) And all three of you hear a loud boom outside the apartment, as as do the people in the leasing office, let's be real. (laughs) How do you react? Um, I, I walk outside and I go, Crud, what are you doing? Knocking louder. <laughs> <laughs> Kay just kind of stands up and uh, just to, to anyone who's in the vicinity is just like, oh, he beat me to it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I guess if her um, aunt in law is in there and and asleep, it'll wake her up. <laughs> and that is what you two are saying as a... Uh, I hope a leasing office agent is coming up here. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, great. Or as, security, at least. <laughs> as a purple... Just see this, locks it on with his foot wedged in the door. <laughs> <laughs> as a purple-skinned man with pointy ears... Dashes up the, I guess, like up the hallway at you, and he he like has this look on his face, like he's he's pretty clearly in charge and he's investigating, and he's <laughs> gonna ask Crud, Doctor Crud the Third. He says, "Excuse me, um, what are you doing?" That uh, <laughs> oh, well, uh, sorry, he has an accent. Exc- excuse me, what? <laughs> Darn it. What are you doing? <laughs> what? what? To that it's door. a welfare <laughs> It's a welfare check. There's an old person inside possibly and we got to make sure that they're okay. I'm knocking loudly so they can hear. Please make a persuasion check. Okay. Hi. I'm not as good as I was before the 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 uh background change but that's gonna be a 17 plus 3 20 nice that is a very high number and you have the added bonus that arian does know that there is an old person who is quite forgetful who lives there so they believe you and he says is tina tina okay that's what we're trying to figure out. Can you open the door? They're not answering. Oh, by the way, I'm a mommy now. See my baby. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see how Arian reacts to Jenny. I'm going to roll on a dice. You get more of those. How is it half elephant, half dragon <laughs> looks? And, uh, and then Robin follows you out. She's a bit slower than Mocha and Cade because she's in her 50s. And she sees Arian there and confirms that... Absolutely, you guys are doing the right thing. Uh, she says, I'm worried about Tinatin, and we don't have her key. So Arian will take out their master key set and open the door for you guys. Good job. Good persuasion check and good handling of the situation. I mean, it, you definitely got the the door open. <laughs> so as soon as he pulls out the keys, um, Kay turns around and says, Yes, I know we should have just asked. Just... Whatever. Apartment 22, Tinatin's residence. The door swings open. 
This apartment has a distinct scent in the air, the smell of the elderly. The floral print couch of the living room has a white lace doily decoratively draped over the back cushion. There is no tinnitin inside. Is the furniture covered in plastic? Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, I, I check, uh, I investigate to see if Tinnitin may have left the apartment, and to do that, I would check whether or not she's uh, wearing her shoes or if her shoes seem to be there. Very smart. Please roll an investigation check. Seven. A seven's below ten. So you. She has uh, many pairs of shoes, and I cannot <laughs> tell whether or not she's <laughs> left. <laughs> But I will be slightly helpful, and I will say that it looks like the house slippers are here. So, like, if she was home, she would be wearing these slippers. Mm -hmm. So, yes, there are many pairs of shoes, and maybe she owns more than one pair of house slippers, but you would say that it would make sense that if she were inside her apartment that she would be wearing them. Okay. So, no more new information. She's not here. <laughs> does, does Robin begin searching the place? Yes, and upon finding that Tinnitin is not in the bedroom, the 50-year-old Tenryu woman slumps her dragon body and angel wings onto the floral couch with the plastic on it, holding her head in her hands, and she sobs. She says, My husband, Anil, he, he comes from a certain type of, of family. His mother, Christina, never worked, and his father, Atul, is a career politician. His aunt, Tinnitin, also mostly stayed at home after being a schoolteacher, after her husband, Jeff, became a judge. May he rest in peace. So, there is a certain expectation of me, but Anil isn't a judge. He delivers the mail. And although it's nice that Christina was able to raise Anil and Tinnitin was able to raise Tanya and Tahira and be with them all the time, that just wasn't realistic for Anil and I. I worked while we raised Sarah and Jane, and I don't think Christina ever forgave me for that. It's always been tense around her. Family pressure. She doesn't talk to me. She sighs. Tinnitin has always been polite, though. Her daughters, Tanya and Tahira, have been visiting less and less recently, and Tinnitin has been forgetting more and more. She, she didn't recognize me the other day. I worry about her, so I stop by and bring her a hot meal and clean a bit before my shift. She looks around in despair. I don't know where she could have gone! She wails and sobs into her hands again. A horrible tiny part of my mind keeps whispering that she fell into the river outside. I just, I couldn't bear it if that were true. So, um, Kate immediately looks around with suspicion, looking for anything, um, that, that might seem like it's out of place or, um, kind of a miss. Wish I'd kept the tech magic, but I did not. Oh, yeah, I did. Um... I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to look. Kate, Kate just looks around for anything that seems like it's out of place, a miss, like maybe there was something that went on in the uh, apartment that should not have, like signs of a struggle or things being mismatched, pictures askew, things like that. Your roll? It is a... Oh, God. Well, um, what am I rolling on? Investigation? Mm-hmm. Nine. <laughs> Similar to Mocha's role, you are looking around for anything, and mostly you're just distracted by how old the items inside this apartment are. There's things in here from 50 years ago that you haven't seen in stores for so long. Everybody? Perception check? Yes. 20? 17. 11. Everybody's above 10, so knock, knock, knock. You hear a knock on the door, and that is where we are going to leave you at the end of this part one. You've got many mysteries and a baby. <laughs> joining <laughs> us this time were Cade. Thanks for joining us. Mocha. Uh, why, can't, why are we stopping here? I want to know where the knock's coming from. <laughs> <laughs> and Dr. Crud the Third. 
I just realized I don't have any diapers. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see you after the break. Bye. <laughs> We hope that you're enjoying this episode of the Fire Breathing Kittens podcast. Please leave us a review on iTunes.com. You can subscribe to receive new episodes through your podcast player or by visiting firebreathingkittenspodcast.com or finding us on YouTube. Can you think of someone who might enjoy this podcast? Please share it with them. We don't pay to advertise this show, so the only way we can grow is through the support of listeners like you. Thank you. You can find more adventures on Amazon.com in the bookstore, Fire Breathing Kittens, all one word, podcast. That's right, you can curl up with a good book based on one of our podcast episodes. The authors do a really great job of adapting them into fun novels. We also have official merchandise on redbubble.com. Yes, that's right. You really can own a notepad with the fire-breathing kitten logo on the front. Or one of your favorite characters. Welcome back to Fire Breathing Kittens, a 5th edition Dungeons & Dragons podcast. We are joined again by Mocha. Hello. Dr. Crud the Third. Baby. And Cade. Welcome back. Everybody, please roll a d20 and let me know what you rolled. And Cade, we can roll for you if you'd like. I got these giant die. I'm good. Okay. <laughs> My d20 is like the size of a softball. 12. Ooh. 13. 19. Okay, I'm holding a 19 up to the camera. Who's the closest to 19? Cade got I rolled 19. Yeah, Cade got it right on the dot. Nice. All right. Please tell us what happened last time. Um, last time we had a new addition to the party, a partial Loxodon, partial dragon named Jenny. We went to the bar called Yesterdays to Celebrate. Meanwhile, while we were there, we were introduced to the waitress named Robin, who is worried about her, I believe, um, aunt, husband's aunt. And so we went to the apartment to check up on her. We also met a gentleman by the name of Maurice, who is a little worried about his coworker who has not been showing up to work, um, who also lives in the exact same apartment complex as uh, Tintin, the um, elderly aunt we are currently searching for. Uh, my buddy Crud decided to make a quick entrance into the apartment, so we... Um, are in there right now, and as of leaving off, we heard a uh, knock behind us, I believe. You also forgot about the pigs. I did forget we were attacked by a, a uh, herd of pigs, and Crud managed to capture them all and turn them into bacon. Thank you, that was a great recap. That leaves you with the knock, knock, knock on the door. Who is it? I'm just checking to see if I wrote down a character voice for them. <laughs> I did not. So I'll just try to speak like a guy. Hello? A male voice calls out. Hi. <laughs> Dr. Crud calls back uh, from inside. <laughs> Concern. Is it? An older man with a dragon's body and angel wings stands at the door. Robin? He says, confused. What's going on? He rushes to her side and bends over, touching her shoulder out of concern. Well, she's sad because her friend's missing, but I'm trying to cheer up with the baby. Look at the baby. He does not look at the baby. Uh, I'm assuming you're a <laughs> Neil. And he kind of ignores you. And he says to Robin, the door was open and you're in here. What's what's wrong? You're crying, honey. And, uh... He's he's a very like long term spouse, just focused on her, and then he he does look around at you all, but he's like, like why is my wife sobbing? <laughs> you must be Anil, her um her husband. We're actually here looking for your aunt Tintin. Yes, that's me. Tintin's missing. What? Well, that's what your wife said that he, that that she's missing, and we came over here to look for her, and yeah, uh, it it seems that she ain't here. Oh no. Oh yes. And he's just slow. He's just catching up on the story, so 
As you guys fill him in, he holds her hand and sits on the plastic covered couch next to her. Is there um is there anywhere you two believe she could be? She could have wandered off somewhere, maybe gone to the store and gotten lost. We we agreed to help you, so we would we need any information you can give us would be great. Robin sobs and says I bring her all her food so she doesn't grocery shop. She should be here at home. I mean, do you think maybe she got bored? Maybe is there like a local bingo place she could have wandered off to? <laughs> maybe she has a, uh, you never know, maybe she has a, um, a, 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 a companion in the complex that she might be visiting. Robin sobs and says, there's, there's nowhere I can think she could have gone. I ask if this has happened before. Anil says, no, this is the first time. (laughs) And you're both sure there's no reason she would not be home for any reason. Anything you can think of would be great. I can't think of any reasons. I tell them uh, that um, earlier today, uh, the guy in his early 20s who we shared a few beers with mentioned about his friend who also went missing uh his friend lives seven uh, doors down in apartment 29 um we should go check that out to see what's going on with him maybe it is uh something that's related oh that's right you've got the leasing office person with you yeah. I, <laughs> so we, oh gosh, Arian looks. What was the leasing person's name? Arian, E R I E N E. And he is a purple skinned, pointed eared fellow. He looks very concerned upon hearing that and says, Two residents are missing? Missing? We believe so. Well, we haven't checked the other apartment yet. Uh, apartment 29. Can, can can let's go over there and, and take a take a gander. Yeah, for all intents and purposes, he could just be hung over. I mean, there, there's no telling. So that it's too little to us, too late to, or it's too early to assume that they have anything in common. Mm. But yeah, I, I agree with uh, Crud. We should probably go check on him just to see. Okay, and you you rolled, I think, a non natural twenty for your persuasion check for Arian earlier, which means that they trust you. And he has the giant set of keys, so yeah, you can, you can open up that apartment twenty nine door if you'd like. Yeah. Plus, 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 it's all the the, the you know the just right amount of blood on my coat. <laughs> the the trustworthy <laughs> amount of I'm a doctor, not the I'm a serial killer amount. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> all right. Um. Yeah. So you are standing in front of the door to apartment twenty nine, and. Arian reaches in. You see a green fabric bracelet on Arian's wrist as he reaches forward and unlocks the door. So he's kind of got like a friendship bracelet on. And as he turns the key in the door, it unlocks. He knocks on the door politely and says, Ankit, Ankit, are you here? Are you home? And... I apologize for the accents, but I'm not going to keep apologizing because that's more annoying than just accents. So so with silence coming from the apartment beyond, the landlord opens the door and is the first one inside because it's his responsibility. Okay, who follows Arian inside the apartment 29? I'll follow behind. Dr. K just kind of, yeah, I think we all just kind of push forward. (laughs) Sounded like it. (laughs) Mm -hmm. (laughs) All right. The door opens upon walls covered with hundreds of pictures of a perfectly sculpted face. Individually, she would look beautiful. Sultry features crafted by a master artisan. She is a golem. But plastered over and over repeatedly on these walls, her face is startling and ominous. Well, this is creepy. Do, do you recognize the, the, the person that he's creating out of this golem dirt? Oh, and it <laughs> is, does look it, like she's a person. A uh, former golem is a, a race that people can be. They can achieve sentience. Um, mm-hmm. So uh, they just tend to be prettier than other people because you can choose what they look like. Anyway, so uh, 
Um, so you ask if Arian recognizes. Arian, Anke, you know, who, who, whoever get, wandered down there with us. Anke's the person who lives here who's missing. Arian oh. is the landlord, the purple-skinned, right. yes. pointy-eared person. Uh, he, I'm just going to do a quick check on him real quick, because uh, he's... Oh, yeah. No, he backs out of this apartment. <laughs> he's like, nope. Oh, God, yeah. <laughs> That's a big nope. Can we do a history check? Yeah. Okay. For the history check, I wrote a, an 11. Mm -hmm. She is not a celebrity figure or a historically important person. And you know that because you got higher than 10. So you're pretty familiar. Like, you're aware. You mm -hmm. know, you read the fantasy equivalent of People magazine from time to time. This isn't one of those people. These actually look a little bit like candid photos, like how the person's not looking at the camera and maybe they're like talking with their hands to someone else and the photo is taken of them. <laughs> oh, no. Stalker. You're saying it's stalker photos. A little, a little, it's a little stalker photos. A little bit. <laughs> oh, no. Do Dr. Crud's going to grab onto Aaron, Arian and uh, and say, uh, what, what's going on here? You seem a bit upset and a little bit disturbed. That is weird. <laughs> well, yeah, can, it seems really stalkerish, but uh, I mean, is there anything specific? Is it just a big weird thing to you? Is that all it is or... That is not okay. That is very strange. I will examine the lease agreement because this this man is not okay. <laughs> well, yeah, no, I mean, obviously we're going to be reporting to the local authority so they can investigate because if he is a stalker, then yeah, he needs to go away. But we also need to find the guy. So, I mean, any more information would be helpful from you. Like, what's that? Uh, what's up with that bracelet? Oh, uh, that's my bracelet. Yeah. Feel the beans about it. Okay, so <laughs> he's going from like a place of I just encountered a creepy stalker serial killer to um, you're asking me about my friendships. And I think it's like a hard mental swerve. So you're going to have to roll a second persuasion check to start chit chatting with him about his love life. <laughs> sure. He's also trying to take his take his uh, mind off of the, the whole disturbing scenario in the room. Yeah, let's say that you've closed the door. You're like, well, that's not good. And you walk down the hallway and you're maybe um, Robin is serving you all cookies. <laughs> so that's going to be a 15 for that one. Okay. And then Mocha and Cade, are you guys also back in Robin's apartment? Uh, No, I want to investigate the creepy one some more. Yeah, me too. Okay, so this is just Dr. Crud the Third. We can always go back in. We can always go back in and, and investigate it after we calm this guy down. Okay. Well, upon seeing, <laughs> we, we we just kind of opened the door. We didn't really look to see if anybody was home. Yeah, we're gonna do a cutscene. So this is Doctor Crud the Third at the same time in Robin's apartment. We'll get back to you, Doctor Crud the Third. We're gonna do this investigation first. So I am. I guess. Uh. Well. What was it? Uh, Arian left the place. He opened the door and then he left. <laughs> he, he peaced right out. <laughs> um, and, uh, oh, I forgot your name. Cade? Cade and I are still at the yes. creepy person's apartment. Um, Arian left and Crud followed inquiring about the bracelet. Um, so I guess, uh, Cade and I will investigate this place further. Plus, I don't think my baby needs to be exposed to that. <laughs> yeah. Okay, investigating further. Please describe what you're doing and your role, and I'll, I'll help you out there. Go ahead, Mocha. Um, I rolled 11, and I'm looking around to see if I can get uh, the name of the golem, fe the female golem in all the pictures. Perhaps like a shrine with... <laughs> her name plat you know in large letters um somewhere in the closet in the dark in the dark room you know those glow glow rooms or whatever they call it, dark rooms yeah you're, yeah you're you're looking for the murder board the, yeah, the, oh gosh so you're in the dark room where ankit develops his photographs so he does you, have a dark room sure and you find a little shrine and it says tulia tulia over and over, T-U-L-L-I-A. 
<laughs> and there's like little candles set up with like a little little Tulia shrine. Absolutely. That's her name. <laughs> Cade, what are you up to? I'm just kind of wandering around to the different rooms of the apartment, <clears throat> the apartment looking for you know, any signs of life or anything that might be you know, slightly amiss aside from the uh, stalker photos. Okay. Signs of life. All right. What's your role? Ooh. Uh, dirty 20. Okay. I think. Hang on. Hang on. Yes. Dirty 20. Yeah. That's a high roll. You're in the bedroom where people normally like store their clothes or you're in like the clothes storage area. And you notice that there are empty drawers where a person's clothing normally would be as if this person had taken them with them somewhere else. All right. So I'm going to run back to um, Mocha and kind of report that, that, <clears throat> hey, uh, Mocha, it looks like someone left in a hurry. All the uh, clothing and everything's kind of gone. Looks like someone bugged out pretty fast. Oh, that's strange. Um, I, I think I remember Maurizio saying that his co-working hasn't been around for a couple of days. Uh, he's been, hasn't reported to work for a couple of days. So I wonder where he went. That's a good question. I don't know. I can't really find anything in the area that indicates um, where he might have gone other than he's, he, he's just gone. Maybe we should uh, ask around, see if anyone else has noticed anything a little strange. Sounds good. And now we're back to Dr. Crud III, who is talking to Arianne and soothing him with a baby and cookies. He's feeling a little refreshed. He's <laughs> less <laughs> creeped out. <laughs> the baby's cooing happily. Yeah. Gurgling. Gurgling happily. Gurgling. I'm sure you're feeding it some of your prepared. You knew it was going to hatch, so you've got food for it. Yeah, didn't know exactly what it was, but he was he was like, you know, it's probably going to eat meat no matter what it is. So, yeah, he's got he's got, you know, baby food meat. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So with your 15, your persuasion checks passes and you can now ask Ariane about his love life, I guess. <laughs> I just wanted to know what the bracelet was about. Oh, <laughs> as he, a distraction, uh, distraction yeah. member uh, of him. Yeah, absolutely. He he wants to be distracted right now. He says, um, yeah, uh, this guy that I've known for a little while and I have been going out and uh, yeah, his name's Diogenes. He's I, I never thought that he would date me. He is way too handsome for me. Uh, <laughs> Um, yeah, but it's been kind of, you know, I mean, it's been kind of rough recently. He's kind of stuck somewhere and, and can't move out. So, uh, I, I've been wanting to ask him to marry me, but it just doesn't seem like the right time. Oh, it never will seem like the right time. You got to just go ahead and do it. Uh, you think so? I, I think he would say yes. I just, I can't, you know, we can't be certain. And he, he really can't move out of where he is right now. So like. We couldn't move in together yet, so... Well, why can't he move out? Oh, uh, well, and then this is going to be a pretty critical part of the story. He's got a secret. How would you convince him that you're trustworthy enough to share? Uh, well, you mean more than just the uh, the perfect amount of blood and the baby? <laughs> yeah. He, he gives him his big old elephant baby brown eyes. It just looks at him, looks deep into his soul and says, you know, you you can tell me I'm I'm there for you, buddy. I, I'll, I will help you in any way I can. That's so supportive. OK, do it. Another persuasion and, oh, check. And of course, he embraces him. <laughs> uh, the Dr. Crud, the third hug. <laughs> OK, that is quite a bit better. That's going to be uh, with a plus three. 21. A 21 is very high. You're not from town, so he feels more comfortable sharing this with you. He says, well, you know, uh, I, I didn't tell you how I met him. <laughs> I haven't been able to tell anybody, and it's such a fun story. Dish it, girlfriend. Uh, okay, okay. So uh, there, my grandma, my great grandmother always had these stories. She's like, there's a white tower out in the wood. And you shouldn't go there, but not because it's scary or dangerous, just because there's people there who have to live there and they can't leave. So, like, don't get messed up in that. And 
I I didn't really meet my great grandmother. That was just a story passed down, like you know, because she used to live there, and so she passed on that story to us. Like, don't necessarily get stuck living there ourselves, is what she said. And I was like, I don't know if that story is true. It's fine. So I went there and I met the people living there and they're actually really nice. And Diogenes, like, he was an orphan when he was little and they took him in. So like, although he has to live there and he can't live anywhere else, like he's actually, it's not that much of a hard lifestyle. He just, he has to do a task once every eight days, whatever. Anyway, so like he, but it's it's like a pretty nice place and he's really cool and um he works out all the time it's he's pretty hot and um, so so we got to be friends and some time passed and i before i knew it oh gosh we were dating and i you know i visit him in his tower um but the problem is that like what do you do if you fall in love with someone who you can never like like he, he has to live in that tower until so theoretically um now, do you know that lady whose face was plastered on the walls? Yeah. Yeah, that's Diogenes' sister, Tulia. Oh, snap. Yeah, and she can go get more orphans and start to raise them and, and take over, you know, so they have to live in the tower. But, like, I'm honestly a little concerned because if this creepy Ankit loser guy, like, what if he did something to her? Then that means... Oh gosh, that means Diogenes is going to be stuck in that tower forever because without new people to take over for him, like the next generation, like he can't move out. Like, oh gosh, and he eats way too many cookies. All right, so this is your 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 Bo's sister yeah. who has to kidnap orphans to work in her tower, and <laughs> then. Once she kidnaps a new orphan, then your bow can move out. Yeah, it doesn't sound great, but they're orphans, so like they gotta live somewhere or they starve on the streets, so they, they're pretty ethical about it. But yeah, Tulia has not gotten any because she's also, although it's her role to do that, she's she doesn't feel great about it, you know. Um, but she can't move out unless she does. All right. Is, the, is there an age limit on these orphans? Because uh, maybe that's why uh, the old lady's missing. You know, her oh, parents are dead. So that <laughs> means she's an orphan. And <laughs> he, like, he genuinely laughs about that. He's like, no, <laughs> they're not bad people. They wouldn't take in anyone who, who didn't want to live there. They're really nice. I. Oh, I, so you're saying you some volunteer, volunteer, voluntary kidnapping. <laughs> It's more like if you need a place to live and you really <laughs> want to live there all the time. <laughs> yeah, I no. Diogenes is so misunderstood. Mm, okay. No, you wouldn't he wouldn't keep it. Like and that's why they don't have any new recruits, is because like they wouldn't keep you there if you didn't want to be there. All but right, yeah, so... he's not gonna be able to move out until they get eight replacement people. Eight? Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's eight oh, of them. Wow. Oh, 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 that's new information that I didn't hear before, but you probably did tell me and I just wasn't paying attention as I, I should have. I, yeah. I oh, <laughs> oh, Arian was supposed to have an accent. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Do it all over again. No. <laughs> <laughs> Jess, there are eight of them. <laughs> I don't know. All right. Uh, well, uh, so. But if, we... but if, if Tulia is missing, then... Diogenes can never leave the the tower. <laughs> so we, we got to go see if she's missing. Uh, we got to see what's up with the old person that's missing. And then the stalker serial killer type dude that's missing. And he's probably gone <laughs> after her. And the old person's probably drowned in the river, according to uh, her oh family. <laughs> so okay. All right. Assuming you were saying all of this out loud, Ariane is, is going to like mild panic again and gonna be like i'm uh, let me let me send a raven to diogenes to ask if tulia is missing and i will get back to you so he's gonna go send a bird and yes of course dr crud says it out loud as he's dr crud <laughs> <laughs> he does <Yeah>. that <laughs> yeah so uh Arian goes to the leasing office and is going to like be like a be back soon. And then he's going to go to his home and send his pet raven to because uh, what do you do if your boyfriend can't leave the tower? You probably set up a bird system. So 
That makes sense. That makes sense. <laughs> yeah. He'll do the heck. <laughs> <laughs> and just to let you guys know, confirmed, Tulia is missing from the tower. <laughs> We're just going to fast track <laughs> that. <laughs> so Dr. Crow's going to walk back into a uh, kidnapper room, <laughs> stalker room. And <laughs> he, he's going to uh, he's going to inform his friends of what he's found out. All right, guys. Well, so far it seemed that uh, well the the leasing agent, his beau, his boyfriend, it lives in the White Tower down the road, and apparently the person that kidnapped voluntarily kidnapped him and seven others is that lady right there in the pictures. Oh, and so, just to clarify, they're all siblings. They were all recruited by the previous generation. What? What? Yeah. What? What? Uh, <laughs> what? God just said. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and it, it, it seems that uh, so stalker murderer guy is might have has taken her because we got the Raven back already and she's missing. Uh so stalker murderer guy my, seems to have taken her. The old lady is probably drowned in the river, just like her family <laughs> thought. But we could check on that. And so, yeah, that's where we're at. Kidnapping, murders, so, uh, drowning, uh, and weird, creepy guy with the pictures. All right. <laughs> um. I, I- so Kay just turns around behind him and says, okay, fine, I'll ask, I'll ask. What, uh, you, you said they had to perform something every so often? It, Did you ask what that was? No. A task every eight days? Yeah, it was yeah, a task. Yeah, every eight days, are we talking like human sacrifice or clean your room <laughs> kind of thing? I, I would say probably not the human sacrifice because he did say that they were nice people. It was voluntary kidnapping. That that did come out a little bit later. It's voluntary kidnapping. Yeah, the the voluntary, uh, the voluntary kidnapping kind of kind of gets me a little. Just well, it seems like hey, they go up, out there. They go up to the, the the kids and say, "Hey, you have nowhere else to play, live. Do you want to go live in our tower? Uh, you cannot leave. It will be permanent until we get somebody to take over you, your spot." And you just got to do a job every eight days. You know, maybe uh, animal sacrifice. I don't know. I mean... Drowning old ladies. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of what I was getting at, you know. Maybe the every eight days is, you know, somebody has to go missing. Or something, you know. Just just throwing that out there. It's a little uh, questionable. Well, we can go over to the tower and uh, and ask, see what the, what the jobs are. Sure, I'm down with that. Yeah, let's go. As long as we can leave the tower after stepping foot in it, I'm cool with that. And and then we'll go dredge the river a little bit later. Go find the old lady. <laughs> yeah, she's she's old. Um, she left a good <laughs> life. <laughs> she she had it coming. You it, know, it's one of it's, those. Things. It's about time she's lonely. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, oh by the way, guys, did any of you find any diapers in her old, in her, uh, in her, <laughs> in her apartment? You know, you know, old people, they, they, they wear diapers. I need some for my baby. Yes, there are adult dragon Tenru or baby elephant dragon sized diapers in Tinatin's apartment. <laughs> Dr. Crud grabs him, leaves a copper, and he puts a diaper on his baby for the first time. <laughs> Only imagine what the baby has been doing since since the first diaper. That's woof. Probably not much. Hopefully, I mean, it's only been alive for two hours. That's true. That's the sh- sure. We'll go with that. <laughs> <laughs> so after paying for the for the di- adult diapers, we're going to the tower. Okay, uh, I'm gonna fast track that because this is the second game, and. Uh, the first game very thoroughly explored the tower. You meet Diogenes. He is a... Like, have you ever seen the movie Gladiator? And how Russell Crowe was the gladiator in that? And he, like, works out a lot and he's got big arms? Yeah. You see why Ariana's was immediately... Uh, <laughs> his opinion was changed. Because Diogenes is, although gruff and a bit angry about being scared for his sister... He has the opinion that Tulia abandoned them. Uh, I'm just going to fast track that and say that 
he explains to you that what they do every eight days is, or every single day, but a different person does it every day, is they set a dinner table for a family, and it's just a tradition they've done for 3,000 years. So no one's getting sacrificed. <laughs> and I'll let you continue on with your mystery. He just expresses concern that his sister is missing and has been for two days. She was supposed to be back um, yesterday. She's not back. So they've been very concerned. They're not allowed to leave the tower, so that they're just like, crap. <laughs> what do we do? Um. So does the name Ankit ring a bell? Great question. And they do not know Ankit because they're only allowed to leave the tower every eight days. So they haven't met a lot of the townspeople. And I will leave you guys there. The tower leaves you with this information. So we just fast tracked through that. Um, there you go. And you're carrying a lot of peaches, apples, and pears because the people in the tower are so concerned about Tulia and unable to leave to find her that they're like, please find her, and then they give you all this food. <laughs> so we have a third person missing now. Great. <laughs> Mocha's just like, why? <laughs> Something is wrong. Well, yeah, Mocha. And she's like, they all drowned in the river. <laughs> <laughs> oh. M Mocha, I already explained to you that we had three people missing. Old lady, which is probably in the river. And then we got Aunt Kit, which is the kidnapper, murdery slasher guy. And then the uh, the sister, who is the victim. Mystery solved. So, we find Aunt Kit. We probably find them all. No, the old lady's in the river. So, well, I guess we do have to find Aunt Kit. Yeah, we, we find him. We'll probably find everybody. But so far, we have virtually no information on Ankit, other than he was a stalker. Right. And no one else in the tower seems to know who he is. So finding him is going to be a little difficult, to say the least. Well. So we should probably see if we can find anyone that knows a little more about Ankit, perhaps Maurice or other co-workers. Yeah, let's go to the pound and go see, or the adop doggy adoption Puppet guys. Puppet fight can Colonel. Uh, yeah. Colonel. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Colonel. And maybe they got uh, they got more information there. Works for me. Onwards. <laughs> okay. Puppify the white spire branch. You are standing in a smooth, flat area in front of the Puppify building. If it weren't for the untended construction scaffolding occupying most of the flat area, You'd say this was a parking lot. Loud barking fills the air. Behind the building, there are rows and rows of metal cages on concrete and fenced-in lawns out back. A tall white tower is visible in the distance. So Yeah, we were just there. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so I'm, I'm leaving you guys in the parking lot in front of the building. There's construction happening here, and then there's a door to the building. All right. Tell you what, you go first. Uh, make sure that scaffolding sound before I cross under it with my baby. All right. Cade pushes uh, forward to the, I'm guessing, entrance to Papa. Absolutely. The construction's a bit unnerving. Like, why are they building a building in front of another building? <laughs> but it is safe, and you do pass unscathed into Papa. Cade, you are first through the door. I would like you to make an animal handling check to see how good you smell to dogs. Ooh, nice. I mean, one second. Oh, no. <laughs> Plus zero. Uh, 11. Okay. I think, yes, 11. 11 is not that bad. You smell pretty good to dogs. It's greater than 10. So nice. a human male in his late teens or early 20s, who you recognize as Maurizio, is teaching a great Dane to sit. When the bell over the entrance door rings... Great Dane, smelling you, you rolled above a ten, so the Great Dane's all excited. It leaps up, bowling over the gangly youth. In contrast to his undignified sprawl on the floor, a beet-red-skinned woman in her mid-forties gracefully emerges from the back area behind the desk and greets you from behind the welcome counter. Welcome to Puppify, she, she calls. <laughs> um, Hi, uh, nice to meet you. We're just trying to... Uh... We come to, to uh, ask about Ankit. We went to visit him, and he seems to be uh, missing. She comes out to talk to you about Ankit, but she has to walk past the sprawled employee on the ground. So she like she 
comes to you and quickly retrieves pulling on the dog's collar to stop it from jumping on you and helps Maurizio up off of the floor. He stands up and blushes almost as red as her. And she says, yes, Ankit. Do you, you know him? The accents. It's supposed to be a Dracula accent. You're welcome. No, we... <laughs> <laughs> no, we just heard that he hadn't been to work in a few days, and we were already in the area looking for um someone else who had been kind of missing. So we thought we'd stop in and give him a visit, but he uh he doesn't seem to be home, and all of his uh it seems like he left home in quite a hurry. So we're trying to see if maybe he was in some kind of trouble, or if you know maybe he was going out of town for a vacation or something. If if he'd mentioned anything at all, he's not home," says Maurizio in his whispering voice. He. He's out of town? I... And then I do have a prompt if you do suggest vacation. Hold on, I did write something about that. The only other place he ever mentioned going to was his vacation cabin in the woods. He was real proud of building that. He took me there once. Nice place. Because no one ever dies in a cabin in the woods. Uh, could you uh, maybe give us directions to that cabin? We'd like to go check on him. Just to, you know, Just to make sure everything's okay. Amy, his boss, turns to him and says, You can have the day off. I could totally give up. Dracula accent. You can have the day off. <laughs> I've got things covered here. And Maurizio says to her, Are you sure? The court case is tomorrow. And Amy says, My employees are more important to me. I am not like corporate. I'm not a bad person. Go. Save on Kit. Who, uh, who do you have to argue with at the court case? Just curious. <laughs> Penelope Ormond, the CEO of Puppify Corporate, to drop the case and withdraw their claim for me to cede ownership of this franchise. Is that why there's all that construction? Mm. Yes. Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh. They are building a second <laughs> building. <laughs> they are building a second building because I refused to expand to take in cats, a violation of their corporate policy. And there's air quotes around that corporate policy. One puppy, ah, ha, ha. Two yeah. puppy, ah, ha, ha. <laughs> I'm sorry, that just hit me when, when you it's did that. Of, uh, yeah, yeah, I don't know if we want to help her, really, because I, mean, I, don't, I don't like cats just as much as the next person, but at the same time, kind of, you know. Look, I'm going to introduce you to Beans when we get back, and you're going to change your mind. Hmm. <laughs> We'll just we'll just go check out this cabin and see how uh, see how that all plays out. Yeah, you you, and you go. We'll, we'll go over that way. You just keep talking to that voice in your head. And we're gonna get your cha mind changed. Okay. Voices. Okay. Jeez. Get it right. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Voices. Mooka, do you like Great Danes? Yes. Ah, I'm glad someone's paying attention to the puppy. That's nice. But I like cats more. Oh! <laughs> I, I like large dogs or cats. I don't like them small dogs. The ones that bark like they own the place until you mm. look at it with like a stern face and it starts whimpering. I love it when they do that. <laughs> Again, evil mocha. Yeah, right? But they're so annoying. They're like, they're barking, like trying to dominate me, but they're so, they're small and it's just, I, I don't know what's wrong with them. They, they have like, um, like the Napoleon dynamite syndrome. The, what is that? What's it called? Like the Napoleon <laughs> syndrome. And then, but then if I just stare at them, they, they like start whimpering and they shut up. Yeah. Cause you're evil. Nah, just those dogs. But the big dogs, you know what I do? Um, I usually, if it's a big dog and I know they're mostly friendly, like even though they're like kind of barking because they're, sometimes they bark. Um, if I crouch down, they start like playing, like they start making a, I want to play with you. And then they come to me and they start licking me and like fluffing around. Ah, and that is exactly what's happening with you and the Great Dane. Yeah. Large dogs don't tend to bark unless it's actual danger. That's true. So yeah, I do that with the Great Dane. Aww. Adorable. So yeah, now that we've gotten the pulling dynamite out of the way, let's uh should we 
head to the cabin and look for our soccer friend? I'm afraid. Yes. Oh, yes. I, I am afraid that we might find yet another missing person on, <laughs> on our trip over to the cabin. <laughs> Who else would be missing? Well, well no, we're going to keep this guy safe. And the missing people are in the cabin, more than likely. Mm. You know, the the on kit, the, kidna- the, the the kidnapped sister, and then the old woman's, you know, stuffed in a trunk or something. <laughs> okay, this is the first time Maurizio has heard about any of that, and they're going to be like, what? What is going on? <laughs> That's what we're trying yeah, to you- find out. Oh, my gosh. Uh, yeah. y- your boy on kit has some, he, he has some boundary issues. Yeah. Uh, we'll we'll explain that later. Let's just go see if we can find him first. Okay. We'll explain on the way to the cabin. You don't even need to roll a persuasion check. He's going to show you to the cabin. <laughs> like, he's concerned. <laughs> and you know his coworker always was a little bit too quiet? And he's, like, shaking his head like, I should have known. Yeah, you should have. I, I should have seen it coming. Oh, man. And he's, you know, he's thinking to himself. Yeah, you should have. So this leads us to Maurizio leading you all to the cabin in the woods. Okay. And dun, this dun, is dun. where we get murdered. <laughs> right? Oh, I won't let you get murdered, Mocha. Don't worry. I'm just worried about you murdering everyone else. <laughs> yeah, that too. But in my intro, I say I heal people and save people. You do. And yet you don't. I do. You do. I and do. Yet you, yeah. yeah. Sure you do. <laughs> Bird song. Dappled light filtering down through leaves. It's a bit of a walk. You're not immediately at the cabin, and you're walking under the deciduous forest trees. Maurizio makes idle small talk with you as you make your way there. You know, I love these woods. I've always felt comfortable here. Almost like something was calling me here, you know? The woods are great. The great outdoors. You're not an orphan by any chance, are you? <laughs> no, I got I got a mom and a dad. <laughs> I, I think you're safe then. You're good. I've been coming to these woods for years. Are you guys from out of town? Yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's where I made a fort when I was little. See over there? I don't care. So you uh, you know these woods pretty well, then. <laughs> um, uh, I mean, on the one hand, Mocha's saying she doesn't care, and on the other hand, Kate is doing polite interest, so I guess he shows you a waterfall on the way, because he's like, here's a waterfall, but then he mostly just keeps quiet, because Mocha's like, I don't care, so okay. Kate's just like steadily looking in the water to see if he sees any old ladies floating around. <laughs> oh my gosh. A branch snaps. Oh no, another stampede. There it goes again. Where More pigs. Let me get my hole out. <laughs> <laughs> there is a shuffling sound, like someone is not picking up their feet as they shuffle walk. Oh no. Is this a zombie? Did oh, Is the old lady a zombie now? Did she get bit by the zombie bug? Maybe she's just old. <laughs> Well, that's true. They do drag our feet, don't they? Yeah, exactly. She's you know, got her bedroom slippers on, just kind of sleepwalking or something. See, see if there's... Let, let's listen a little more. See if there's a walker imprint, too. <laughs> <laughs> a little clank behind the steps. Yep. Clank, clank, shuffle, shuffle. Clank, clank, shuffle, shuffle. I would like to do a... Uh, a check if I can to see if I can uh, identify maybe the size of whatever we're hearing. Absolutely. Thirteen, thirteen plus something. I'm going to say fifteen. I'm pretty sure that's a two. That's a pretty high roll. With that roll, you can perceive with your eyes because they're not trying to hide. They're just walking along. An extremely elderly dragon with angel wings is before you. Her muscles hang oddly on her skeleton, her rib cage a barrel on stick arms and legs. Her face sags, wrinkled. She is holding not a walker, although that is a great idea. If I didn't already have her holding something, I would have said yes and to that. But I don't know how she'd carry both. <laughs> so let's say she's going with a cane. Cane in one hand. <laughs> and in the other hand, a full glass of lemonade. 
perception check? <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, that one didn't go well. That's an eight. Six. Fifteen. Dr. Crud the third can tell, even from this distance, you guys will notice when you get closer, that there is precipitation on the glass of lemonade. It's still cold. Uh, sweetheart, are you okay there? Tinatin? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I yell out. <laughs> she recognizes her own name. She calls, she calls back to you. Hello. Oh, thank God you're not drowned in a river. <laughs> she, she looks confused and sort of stumbles away from you and starts to head off in that direction. Dr. Crud Netzer. What her? Netzer. Nets? N yeah. Net? Net. N-E-T. What? Okay, roll it to hit. <laughs> no, Dr. <laughs> no, Dr. Crud just walks up to her. <laughs> To her and grabs her, redirects her towards everybody else. Oh, hello, she says again. We've been looking for you for such a long time. Not really, not really. A baby! She's yeah, so oh, excited yeah. to see your baby. This oh, is Jenny. She's oh. two hours old. She looks just like my daughter, Tahira. And hey, look, your diapers fit her just fine. Oh, <laughs> Uh, what color is the baby Bjorn that that Jenny is in? Um, I think it will be it's it's pink. Ah, it's pink. Pink would look good on Tahira, and so would yellow, the color of the dress that the nice girl was wearing. Not nice girl. Uh, who, where, what, why, how? Yes. Look at the oh. baby. Uh, okay. Um, <laughs> Ma'am, what what girl in the white yellow dress? Where did you see her? At the lake. The lake is so beautiful. I want to go there with Jeff. My husband, you know, he just became a judge. Ah, okay. And how long ago did you see this 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 woman? Just now. And she's just like, la, 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 la. Yeah. All right, guys. She ain't up all there up the stairs. Kate turns behind him and looks around and just like, it's just it's just a little dementia. It's OK. It's OK. Uh, all right. Uh, um, what, Aaron, where is the uh, cabin from here? Because we're going to need you to take her back to town. Maurizio. Or Marit is it Maurizio? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Aaron's the in the uh, the leasing office guy. Maurizio, how, how far is this cabin? And is there a lake around here? And we, we, we need you to take her back to town. Yeah, the cabin at the lake is just past that hill. Oh, crap. It's a cabin at a lake. Okay, it's just over the hill, you said? Yeah, and a little bit this way. He, Mocha is glaring at him because she doesn't care. And he's like, um, <laughs> I, yeah, I could take you there real quick. All right, and then once once we get inside of the cabin, I need you to take this this uh, tin tin back back home. And make sure that her sister know Robin knows that she's there. Oh, okay. And make sure the door is locked. Where does she live? What? Uh, 3901 Wendo Road, apartment 22. Yep. Oh, that's right by Ankit. Okay, got it. Yeah. yeah. It's yeah, the same complex at, as Ankit. Just yep. don't look in his room. <laughs> yeah, do, do not... <laughs> Just ask for Aaron, and they'll take Miss Tin Tin back to her room, preferably deadbolt it, <laughs> and it'll be okay. Okay, yeah. So, do you want me to just show you where the cabin is then, or? Yeah, 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 yeah. Show, show us yeah, the cabin. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. All right. Sounds like you guys have a plan. All right. Uh, I'll just yeah. It's this way. <laughs> we do. And then you guys are moving at the pace of an old lady now. So it's uh, actually, do Dr. Crud will throw her on her shoulder and just walk. She's sitting on his shoulder. Oh, so you've got a baby and an old lady? <laughs> okay. Yeah. They're both, they both weigh about the same. <laughs> okay. As long as you have no hands free, I'm going to allow that. Okay. All right. Wait, don't you have a free trunk? Yeah, I do. You have one free trunk. What do you get? <laughs> yep. <laughs> 
I can just see you casting spells out of your trunk. <laughs> I, I shoot snot out of that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's a weird looking magic missile. <laughs> So you all are walking through the woods following Maurizio. You've acquired one old lady with a glass of lemonade. <laughs> <laughs> you are walking along. Oh. oh, okay. Oh, you have acquired. Maurizio says, I hope I can remember the way. It's been uh, two years since I was here. You know, that he always gave me the creeps on Kit. I, I think I'm going, I, you know, I don't know why I stopped coming here and in my childhood, I always really liked these woods. Yeah, I should have, you know, I should come here more often. I uh, I have to ask, if he, if he gave you the creeps, why did you agree to come to his cabin? It was when we first met one another and he was building it and he asked for help building it. So I came out here and I did help him. And honestly, you know, I should come out here more often. I, I, something about these woods feels very homey, you know, doesn't it feel that way to you? No, not at all. So your loss is what you're saying. <laughs> uh, I'm sure it's just over that hill, and you guys are at the top of a hill now, and you're looking down. Perception check? Oh, gosh. Mm -hmm. uh, 14. Uh, 10, 11. 18. You all rolled above 10. So all of you see the glowing yellow figure 100 feet away. It's gliding up to you all 90 feet away. 80 feet away. Ah, right, take the old lady, Murray Seal. He doesn't respond to you. His eyes are locked upon it, wide, as it gets 70 feet away, 60 Kate feet away. Kate just immediately whips out his shield and his battle axe <laughs> and just go, goes ahead and preps Green Flame Blade just because. Mm. We, we, we gotta at least try to talk first. Come on now. now. I'm not attacking. I'm prepping because something bright and glowing is heading to us really quickly. I also ready up. <laughs> Dr. Yeah. Crud puts the old lady down and uh, uh, right right in front of Mauricio, hopefully blocking his sight from the, from the, the golden yellow floaty thingy. Is there any reaction from him? He moves to continue to look at it again. He seems stricken. He's standing straight with his back. At a perfectly straight, his head tilted. That song, it's so beautiful. His mouth opens, and he's moving it up and down, but he's not saying anything. It looks like he's singing, but there's no sound coming out. What if we just leave him? <laughs> well, he doesn't know where he's going, but I can't in good. Con I cannot in good conscience just leave him. We we can uh we oh God, we're gonna have to hog tie him and take him with us. Is a glowing light a person? <laughs> yes, it is a person. And it is the yellow form is featureless in front of you all. If it's singing, you can't hear it. Maurizio's mouth has been moving this whole time. So that's why I always felt comfortable here? I was this whole time? Wow. A species recognition password? Huh? His mouth continues to move, but makes no sound. Maurizio's skin begins to glow yellow. He turns and says something to you, happy and excited, but you hear nothing. Seeing the confused look on your face, he says, My people! I'm a cowbird! Then his skin turns into glowing yellow <laughs> light. His You're a coward? <laughs> cowbird. <laughs> his clothes drop to the ground, discarded, and he steps forward and takes the other figure's hand. They both fly off into the distant sky. Well, well, that happened. Another missing person, Maurizio. <laughs> he has well, no, floated away. He's, he's not missing because we missing. saw what we happened. We know where he went. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he's uh, not necessarily missing. He's just gone. Ha has anybody else heard of a race called Coward? Cowbird. Cowbird. <laughs> I heard Coward. I'm sticking with that. Moo, caca. I, uh, I, I have not, and I'm just gonna chalk this up as a, uh, yeah, that happened. Everybody okay. roll a nature check. I, I was just gonna ask to do that. Ooh, eighteen plus nineteen. Twenty-two. 
18. Oh man, you guys. Plus negative one, so 17. Throat so high. I get a plus five in it. Uh, I got a minus one. You all rolled very high. Okay, well then you all know about this. Um, here's some true facts about nature from your DM. Brown-headed cowbirds do not raise their own young. Instead, they lay their eggs in the nest of other bird species. As a result, young cowbirds are not exposed to species-typical visual and auditory information like other birds. Despite this, cowbirds are able to develop species-typical singing, social, and breeding behaviors. A 2017 study demonstrated that cowbird brains are wired to respond to the vocalizations of other cowbirds, allowing young to find and join flocks of their own species. These vocalizations are consistent across all cowbird populations and serve as a species recognition password. If a young cowbird is not exposed to these password vocalizations by a certain age, it will mistakenly imprint upon the host species. Maurizio was a cowbird? I mean, he looked pretty human to me, but, you know. The only human in this adventure. Yeah, right? <laughs> not anymore. <laughs> 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 the old lady's like, wah, wah. wow, I should get a dress for Tahira. That's that yellow color. She would look beautiful. <laughs> You're absolutely right, sweetheart. All we got to do is find her. So can you tell me which way the lake is? Yeah, and you guys are one hill from the, the cabin. Yeah, he he kind of pointed in the direction of the cabin. Yeah. So are we still kind of heading the direction? Yes. As you reach the top of okay. the next hill, you look down upon the cabin and the lake. All right, so we have nobody to take the old lady back, so we're going to have to keep our old lady in our inventory, so this is going to be bad. <laughs> we could tie her to the oh, tree Lord. and get her when we're done. <laughs> I was actually oh God, considering I that. that. I love that Mocha's the one that said it. <laughs> but I, I was considering that. Um <laughs> Let me see if I have like a sedative and maybe she can like sleep it off under a tree. Um, sleep off dementia? <laughs> well, sleep off whatever's going to happen down here. Uh, I'm trying to see if I have any spells that might do anything, but I can't read my spells. <laughs> I mean, I could give her an adrenaline oh. shot. <laughs> I don't think that's going to work, though. Oh, I should not have let Luke Skywalker give me eye surgery the other day. Uh, I'm pretty sure all my spells would kill her. <laughs> oh, I'm not going to cast anything. Don't, 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 yeah, don't kill her, please. <laughs> it, would an Eldritch Blast help in any way? You would ha end up having to be lectured by Dr. Crud for the next three years if you kill her. <laughs> All right, fun fact about cowbirds, they normally lay their eggs in the nests of tanagers. Of what? Tanagers. It's another type of bird. Well, he's oh, okay. a, Tanager's also a character on the show. I am. That's why I included it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, I do love that our, our mocha was the one that's like, <laughs> let's tie her to a tree. I had I actually was thinking about doing that, too. So. Hey, wait, do I have... I've got a magic skull that will not help in any way. <laughs> oh, yeah. I forgot to give you some bad luck because of that. No, you didn't. <laughs> I found a crazy old lady. What do you mean? It's bad luck. I totally found the speech that I was supposed to read by Arianne. Do you guys want to hear it? Sure. You can cut it in wherever. wherever. All right. There, there is a certain family legend about that. My great-grandmother, she told stories. She told us a tale of a magic tower in the forest. A tall white tower with everything you could ever need inside. Everything except freedom. As much food and drink and revelry and safety for your family as you could ever want, but at a price. If the daily offering is not made in the tower, then the world will end. She say, we must always appreciate the people trapped there and thank them for their service, but to never go there ourselves. Well, that just sucks. <laughs> Do they have internet there? <laughs> and and what exactly is the daily offering? I mean, we, we know it has to be a table. Uh, yeah, a, it's a table setting. A ta table set. Yeah. Okay, but I mean, is there any spe specificities? No, you just have to set the table every day. 
Oh, that's not so bad. Well, nah. Once every eight days, we take turns. Yeah. And if you don't, the world ends. Apparently. I mean, that's not that hard to keep the world from ending, I suppose. Yeah. But they're also interesting kids to do this. So, the, oh, yeah. the uh, fact yeah. that the world hasn't ended is a miracle. Yeah, that's, that's you're, you're no kidding. They, they train the children to take over. You say that. Who trains the children? Previous residents? Yeah, the previous residents. Okay. I mean, small price to pay for no Ragnarok? All right, I found the page. I mean, Sorry, I have 18 pages for some reason of planning for this, so bad idea. <laughs> so I found great idea. the stuff. We are now ready to proceed. Sorry, everybody. Well, let, uh, Dr. Crud is going to go ahead and take care of the old lady real quick before we proceed. What he's going to do... I throw her in a hole? <laughs> <laughs> no. He is going to uh, take his rope out of his bag, tie a harness... And baby Bjorn her on his back, with, and his baby is baby Bjorn on his front. Okay. So. Man of many talents. <laughs> Which direction do you dodge in? No, no, that's a bad question. Do you expose your front or your back? Uh, Dr. Crow's just going to hang out in the back and not be the target. Okay. Lots of, uh, he, he has lots of, uh, you know. A big sign. There's a new tattoo right below the Fire Breathing Kittens one saying baby on board. <laughs> old, your old lady in the rear. <laughs> oh my goodness. Oh God. <laughs> I hope it doesn't say that. No, it oh. doesn't. It doesn't. Nice. All right. So Cade and Mocha, you are taking point on this, I guess. That's fine. Cade is uh, generally one that jumps in front of danger. So he's he's good to go. Yeah, I think I can save them if anything were to happen. Okay. You can, but will you? I will. <laughs> I always do. Okay. That's why you brought a doctor. <laughs> All right, let's uh, proceed forward. I'll, uh, if we got Mocha ready to um, apply some Band-Aids, I will just kind of push forward so that the uh, baby on the back of the locks or on the front, front, back, Baby's on the front, old lady's on the back. Okay. Uh, why don't you just uh, maybe walk backwards, um, bud, and Mocha can kind of guide you. You know, just as a precaution. You want? Oh, so you want to make sure that the old lady gets it first? I mean, <laughs> wouldn't you rather? <laughs> I, I would rather nobody gets it first. I mean, unless you want to walk sideways. <laughs> sideways works. I do the shuffle, you know? Or I could just walk normally yeah. and we cannot, you know, screw everybody up. Well, nope, no, that's perfectly fine. I will rush forward so that if anything happens, you'll be in the very back and we'll have, you know, the least amount of collateral damage. Or, Noted. you know, no damage. Let's Preferably. go. Noted. Let's go with least amount. <laughs> How much distance is there between the people in the front and the... Dr. Crud III in the back. Uh, I'm going to say Cade rushed forward. So I'm going to say there's at least 20 to 30 feet between me and... Me. Mocha. Uh, I'll be in between. Crud. <laughs> okay. Okay, and then Mocha, how much so 30 feet between me and Crud and 20 between Mocha and myself. Excellent. Got mm, it. I would want no? to be a little bit work? more than that so that okay. it's usually out of the range <laughs> of most things. So you two, you know, in case you trigger something, spells. most things have about a 30 feet ra radius or 30 feet range. Fine. You, you're, you two are walking side by side then. How about that? That sounds good. About 35 feet away. Okay. <laughs> oh, oh, Dr. Crud's not a coward. He's, he's going to be, he's not going to be that far behind you. Yeah, but you're, you're a mommy now. Yeah, you're caring. It's not about you. It's about the baby and the old lady. I mean, yeah, the old lady's there too, I guess. But you know, just you—you you do whatever you were comfortable with. Just don't drown her in a river, please. We just found her. You're the one carrying her. I have no control over it. Yeah, I have no control over that. <laughs> if she takes a swan dive, I'm just gonna say I can't swim very well. 
So moving that's on. That. Moving on. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh yes. So there's a cabin next to a lake. Yep. What do you guys do? Does, does anything blow up on our way to the cabin? No, nothing blows up on your way to the cabin. Oh, thank God. Are there any signs of life, um, light inside or anything? Yes. From this direction, you're on the back side of the cabin, so you could move around to be able to see the front door. There, are, There's no back door. There's just the one. With log cabins, it's easier to not have doors. Are there windows? One person constructing a log cabin by themselves. I'm going to go with a no. Mm. Yep. All right, team, I got an idea because... Crud, you've got, you know, you're, 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 you're kind of rolling around for three. You two chill here. I'm going to go bang on the door and stay away from the door just in case, just in case. And we'll go from there. Does that sound okay? Yeah, go knock. Yeah. All right. So Cade walks up to the door and just, Wait, instead of you, politely knocking. Hold on. Oh. You round okay. the side of the building and you see a front porch. Yeah. All right. A beautiful golem, her delicate features carved by a master artisan, is rocking on a chair on the front porch. Seeing you, she holds up a tray of glasses of lemonade and smiles. Travelers? Oh, this is not good. You must be weary. Have some lemonade. So Kate immediately turns to Mocha and Crud. I'm like, don't drink the Kool-Aid. I mean, lemonade. Let's let's just not. Why? Just in case. Who's there? What? What? Just, just. There's a golem up here, and she's got some Wait, lemonade. And you mean the old lady had lemonade. sister? Yes, I, I'm guessing. Tulia? Yeah, yeah, I would know. Tulia's I the there. We found another yes, missing Tulia's person. Tulia's up here. We, she's offering me lemonade, and she doesn't seem surprised by the fact that a half creepy looking half elf just kind of popped up out of nowhere. So maybe avoid whatever she gives you. Just saying. Yes. You do you. I, I don't. I, you know. You, you do you. But I'm not desperate enough to attempt to drink whatever this lady has. Says the person yeah. who ate so. cookies from an old lady's place without hey, asking. Hey, hey, hey! I crumbled those things to little microbes and checked first before I ingested the cookie dust. All right. Yeah. It, it was cookie powder by the time I actually ate them. I mean, this could be on kit and their cookies. Come on, this this could be on kit's doing with the whole drugged her and and doing all that. So, uh, madam, where well, is, where's on kit? <laughs> Ignoring his two arguing friends who are debating <laughs> who crumbled cookies and who is <laughs> more likely to drink lemonade, <laughs> the one person walking carrying three people. Elephant rounds the corner <laughs> and she, seeing you, holds up a tray of glasses of lemonade and smiles. Travelers, you must be weary. Have some lemonade. Very like Stepford Don't Wives do it. vibes. Don't do it. Dr. Crud will take the glass and uh, do a sleight of hand to shoulder it and then <laughs> smile at her. <laughs> she smiles back at you and it's a beautiful smile. The, where's where's on kit the door of the cabin swings open and a man part fly part human roars at you what are you doing he here this is my cabin leave well your your little girl right here was being all nice and bubbly uh who are you why are should you i tell kit? you you're on kit aren't you maybe who are you yeah, that's a yes hi on kit uh why did you kidnap her I didn't kidnap her. I saved her. From? This golem was being brainwashed by a cult. She was a prisoner. She was only let out of that white tower once a week. It looks like she's being brainwashed right now by you with the, uh, with the, with the lemonade. And you see, this little old lady, she got brainwashed by the lemonade, too. And he turns around and shows him the old lady, turns back around. Her? Why won't you people leave us alone? Just leave us alone. This is my cabin. Leave. Oh, you did this to her. Uh, so just to walk you through the timeline, 
You walked up to the porch, you got offered some lemonade, and then a dude told you to leave. Mm -hmm. So you could assume the same thing happened to the old lady. She probably yeah. walked up to the front porch. Yeah, so by did this to her, I don't think Ankit's responsible for his neighbor's dementia, but um, you could blame him for that, I guess. Oh, She was walking around with lemonade there, and that's, you know... Oh, yeah, Dr. Crud's throwing all the blame to him for everything. <laughs> yeah, why is the lemonade still cold after the um, lady's been missing all day, more than a day, because she wasn't there in the morning? Right, so she has been wandering around these woods for a few hours, but she found the cabin pretty recently, which is why you found mm -hmm. her. And she vicinity. made her lemonade there? She was holding a pitcher, so did she make the lemonade inside the cabin? That has no electricity and therefore no ice? Uh, okay, so... Oh, magic. Magic, got it. <laughs> the golem is holding a tray of glasses of lemonade. The mm -hmm. old lady was holding a glass of lemonade. Ah. Uh, and if you would like to roll an arcana check, I will tell you more information. Um, no, it's okay. I will. But at the same time, it's because Cade is not um, patient. And he is rolling very poorly, I believe. No? Hang on. Let me, let me use my good eye. Oh, that's a minus one. Darn it. Okay. Well, he rolled a 13. But he's stomping up the steps. And how... Uh, can you please describe... Um, the fly man, a little more like, you know, how big is he? Tall, broad, things like that. He is a five and a half foot tall human with a fly head and fly hands. And Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So Kate immediately just grabs him by the collar and lifts him up and just stares daggers into his, t into his eyes and just demands that you tell me what is going on right now, every detail or else. Make an intimidation check. Ooh, I've been waiting on that. And I'd like to hear Mocha's Arcana check because I don't want to leave her behind. Oh, I, I don't oh, need to do Arcana. I, I would help with your intimidation, but I have a baby and an old person, so I don't think uh, I, could, I could help. I have a plus eight to intimidation, and I rolled a 13. Okay. Uh, Mocha, what's a number for your Arcana check? Uh, nine. Okay. With a nine, you would say that it's very easy to make things cold with magic in this world. And it's uh, that you remember a lot of the schools of magic. There's abjuration, evocation, enchantment, illusion, etc. Sounds good. I was good yeah. enough of just like magic. <laughs> mm. <laughs> <laughs> it is magic. It can be magic. Yeah, you've seen wizards, they're doing cold spells all the time. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, Abjuration protects things. Illusions make stuff look like other stuff. Enchantment, you can make people do stuff. And etc. There's eight schools. Necromancy, you can make the dead do stuff. Is it safe to assume that one of these three people is capable of doing magic? Absolutely. In fact, you would say that the fly person in front of you probably would have had an easier time building this cabin in the woods if they could do magic. Okay. Mm. So now, Cade, with your 20 intimidation. 21. <laughs> the fly man wilts in your hands. He's definitely not, like, he's not a wolf man. He's not a bear man. He's a fly man. So <laughs> <laughs> he... He cowers and shakes in your hands. I just shake him back and forth, telling me, you know, uh, demanding that he, you know, tell me what is going on. Why does she seem out of it? Why is this old lady carrying around a glass of lemonade? What's in the lemonade? And why do people think you're all missing? Okay. Um, could you do one question and I'll do one answer? I, I just, sure. I want to get to the, so, uh, yeah, first things first. <laughs> uh, first off, why, well, he's already answered why, uh quote-unquote, kidnapped the golem. She had a sacred duty. How did you convince the golem to come out here? I reprogrammed her. You Wow, okay. She's just a golem. If she's just a golem, why were you so obsessed with it with her? Well, she's beautiful. That's creepy. 
Stalker. Not even that. Like, I'm thinking, never mind. Creepy stalker, yeah. Yeah, he's a creepy stalker. Yeah, sure. So, knowing that he's a creepy stalker, what do you do to right the situation? I want to throw him in the river. <laughs> I think that's very admirable. What did you do to this old lady? Why is she carrying around a glass of lemonade and just out of her mind? She came up She's to been the missing porch. for a long time. She came up to the porch and was talking to Tulia, and I couldn't have that. I didn't want to be discovered here, so I told her to leave. Just like I'm telling you to leave, and then he cowers again. <laughs> I dare you to tell me to leave one more time. Ooh, we're going to do an opposing charisma check. Ready? Roll your charisma, and he'll roll his. Oh, bring it. What is that? A net 16 plus <laughs> 5. A 21. His large fly eyeballs size you up and his lower lip trembles and he doesn't say a word. What? Oh, that's okay. That's okay. Can you program her back to what she was? Yes. Uh, I want you to reprogram her to make her the way she was before you messed with her. She has a sacred duty and I don't know about you, but I don't want the world to end. <laughs> I have a section for that. If they make Ankit drop the mind control on Tulia. Got it. The fake smile. I'm going to. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, uh, you can you can say your thing. What? I was going to use my um my background technique, actually. Yeah. Because would you consider him a quote unquote commoner? Yes. So essentially, I uh, I look into his eyes and. I half am screaming at him to do as I say, but I'm also half imploring him to just please do the right thing. And my eyes are failing me, so I can't tell you the name of the the thing, but it's part of the Haunted One background. Yeah. And it's to basically get any commoner to kind of go along with what I'm doing. Absolutely. This below level one non-playable character cowers in the arms as you literally are lifting him up off of the ground of this Cade ghost bane fire breathing kittens adventurer and he he just crumples like a piece of paper in your hand like like his ability to oppose you is completely gone he drops the spell on tulia and uh i know the fake smile drops from her beautiful clay face she frowns she looks left, then right, like a person waking up. Where am I? How? She sees Ankit, the flyman. Her eyes widen as she remembers. She backs away from him hurriedly, dashing the tray of lemonade to the ground of the porch. The glasses explode into fragments of glass and bits of sweet lemonade. She hurriedly tripping over her own feet and landing in a heap on the ground away from the porch, scooting backwards in the leaf litter, gets away from him and starts to scream. Dr. Crud bends down, picks her up and embraces her. It's all right, sweetheart. It's all right. You're safe now. You're safe. We got the- <laughs> Now carrying three people. <laughs> yeah, we, 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 got, we got the evil fly, man. He ain't going to be no bother to you no more. She cries into your baby Bjorn. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, you can see that the baby is starting to pick up a little bit from from uh, from mommy crud as the baby starts stroking the top of her head a little bit. Aww. The telepathic link has started to establish. <laughs> Please tell me it's with her trunk. Can I cast hold person on the fly guy? Absolutely. Ooh. He is restrained by your hold person spell, and his pathetic NPC attempts to escape are completely stopped. I tie him up. Completely restrained by that, too. He is just a, a weak little fly man. And does anybody else have anything they'd like to do before we end this adventure? I was going to go into the cabin and see uh, what all he had been up to. He Loot was... the cabin. Loot yeah. the cabin. Yeah, that was kind of what I was going with. Yep. It's uh, pretty barren in there. Definitely not like like we would put stuff in a cabin that he would not put in a cabin. So... So you guys find two uncommon items from the uncommon item list, and you can 
keep those uncommon items if you'd like, and you can, after the game, decide upon the two uncommon items that you found. But yeah, it's not pleasant in here. It's not, like, it's not the vacation home that you were hoping. Yeah, I mean, it's a fly, man. I feel like there's like a lot of uh, nastiness yeah. laying around, you know, rotten food, uh, things like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because, you know, they eat food by like, they suck on it. It's gross. Yeah, yeah. Gross. Yeah. Um, do we do we decide if there was anything in the lemonade or if it was just lemonade? Tulia made that, so it's just normal. <laughs> okay. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Darn, could have got a glass of lemonade. <laughs> <laughs> it was a very Stepford Wives lemonade. It was like lemonade made under duress. Okay, so anything else before we end this adventure? Dr. Crud burns it down. What? Nice. <laughs> <laughs> and are you guys going to turn... Uh, are you guys going to release Ankit? Oh, we're no. going to turn him in. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I guess we'll turn him in. And then, yeah, as a side thing. I was going to turn him inside out, but it's fine. <laughs> well, maybe you got a reward on him or something. Yeah, we got to take him to the proper authorities. They're going to try him. And if that, we do not murder Hobo, okay? We do not murder. But he's a stalker. That's true. And he's going to get his just desserts in prison. You do know what okay, they I do. I guess he's restrained. You do know what they do to stalker types. That's true. That's very true. So, yes, prison would be much worse than what I was going to do. Yep. So, <laughs> yeah, we, t- we take him to the proper <laughs> authorities. And I guess we use his room as evidence that he is what we say he is. A creeper. Yeah, absolutely. It's not hard to prove this at all. No, he's yeah, he's behind bars, you guys. Good job. Um, so I've got two epilogues. Would you like to hear the one for the old lady or the one for Tulia first? No preference. Let's okay. do Tulia. All right, we'll do Tulia because you guys, you know her less. Tulia returned to the White Spire and was greeted joyously by her family, even by Diogenes, the brother that she had been arguing with. She immediately commanded that on their days off, the family begin recruitment of eight willing orphans who had been starving on the streets of Jishop and Nicomoy. That way, they can start passing down their traditions and it frees up the family members to be able to leave. They can come back, you know, but they would be able to leave. To the fire-breathing kittens who saved her, she sent a pouch of 5,000 gold each. Please add 5,000 gold to your character sheets. The training of the next generation of the White Spire commenced. They fed the children, taught them their ways, taught them the daily rituals, and asked if they would be willing to take over their places when they grew. Ten years later, Tulia transferred the white lights from her generation to the next. The daily rituals continued every day, every day for years, a dinner table set for a family. After transferring the light, Diogenes moved in with Arianes, and they got married. Nice. But he still had to wait another decade? <laughs> yes. Yeah, right? That sucks. <laughs> <Sorry. laughs> okay, and I have a ending for so many pages. I have an ending for, 10, for the 10, The little old lady. The little old lady. Who didn't drown in the river. She didn't drown in the river. Ten years later, this is her eulogy. Oh, God. <laughs> Okay. Okay. I wasn't gonna say that. <laughs> oh, you beat me to it. I can't find the page, so I'm just gonna wing it. Right? Why make you wait? Okay. So, the mother-in-law of Robin, Christina, had never really liked her daughter-in-law, even though she had raised children with her son, brought her grandchildren, brought her two beautiful grandchildren. It was always a cold relationship. But after. You guys rescue Tinatin and bring her back. It becomes obvious to Christina and her husband, Anil's parents, that Robin had been doing an excellent job taking care of Tinatin, and that without Robin's care, Tinatin would have been much, much worse off. So they develop a family action plan to take care of Tinatin long term. And Christina, realizing how much of a help Robin has been to the family, forgives her for their age-long dispute and starts being actually nice to her daughter-in-law. And um, and for Mocha, years later, there's a eulogy for Tinatin. How's that? <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> You're welcome. So um, I will say that the family grows closer because they realize that, especially Tinatin's daughters, Tahira and 
Tanya. Tanya. Thank you. I have so many pages. To hear in Tanya, the grown daughters of Tenetin, they appreciate all of the meals that Robin has been bringing her and all of the cleaning and the changing and the, the home health care. And so the family truly accepts all of all of their members. And uh, you guys have really done a great service today. And they all give Dr. Crud the Third a hug. Aww. 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 What about the Popify place? Did they win the lawsuit or are they closed <laughs> do you, down? Yeah. Do you guys remember that elf in the bar? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so here I've got the Pubify store, if nothing is done about it, will, after a long legal battle during which the temporary store functions out of the parking lot out front, be taken from the franchiser Amy Naden and returned to corporate ownership. Uh oh. Oops. <laughs> that womp womp. And that's her own fault. She was trying to fight the franchise rule, and she does get fairly compensated. She gets a, a lump sum that she could use to open her own non Pubify kennel. Well, to be fair, Beans oh, yeah. isn't here, so we had no lawyers. Right. You, <laughs> if you'd had a lawyer, you could have done something about it. But that land doesn't belong to Amy and Aiden. It belongs to the corporate side. So, mm -hmm. yeah. All right. So and then uh, Maurizio spends a few weeks flying and then transforms back into his human form. And, and you know, with the world and the planes and the exploration available to him now, he is able to live both as a human and a cowbird. I heard coward again for some reason. Coward. I I heard coward. So leaving the, the family making the the round-the-clock care action plan for Tinitin and bonding with one another and leaving Tulia back in the White Tower doing what she's supposed to be doing and leaving the Puppify <laughs> kennel doing what it's doing. Do you guys have anything else you'd like to do in this adventure today? I, I know, but I just love that we never questioned the White Tower thing. Like, yeah, okay, world ends if they don't set the table. So, yeah, okay, all right, just go for it, <laughs> whatever. Well, that's what usually happens in a white tower anyway, so. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> just, I don't question it, just let it happen, you know. It is what it is. Mocha, any closing thoughts from you? Mm, I'm curious about how the other episode ended, the one from yesterday <laughs> and or which path they took. But Oh, yeah. They can, listeners can listen to that episode. It's so the one that came before this one. <laughs> exactly. It is called Have Your Goat and Eat It. So if you're interested in what they got up to, which was an entirely different path than you guys did, then yeah, enjoy. Well, thank you all so much for joining us today. Joining us today, we're Mocha. Bye, guys. Dr. Crud the Third. Here lies 10 to 10, drowned in her own bathtub. Oh my goodness! She has several several years left with um, bringing the family together to care for her. Okay, and Cade. <laughs> Thank you all for joining us. Please, please come back next time. <laughs> I broke him. I broke him. Yes, you did. <laughs> oh. Bye. Bye. Error four hundred four. Hi, I'm David Sweeney Bear, narrator and producer of Tales from the Vault, a hand-picked selection of creepy classics, weird tales, and short stories from the greatest authors of all time. Each story is an immersive audio experience brought to life for your listening pleasure. You can find the Tales from the Vault podcast at youtube.com slash dsbaudio. Also on Apple, Stitcher, Spotify, and Google Podcasts. Or you can visit my website at dsbaudio.com. The following is a brief bit of the Pedro and Banana podcast. Do you know what really um, freaks me out about the mask, yeah? Everyone's wearing a mask, right? CCTV mm. everywhere, yeah? You mm. think this is a fantastic opportunity for bank robbers. <laughs> yeah, Nobody's I know. Nobody's robbed a bank. Yeah, Nobody's robbed any banks. I've What's been exactly going on? the same thing. I thought banks would be getting dropped left, right and centre. Just any kind of crime like that where, where CCTV is yeah, necessary. Where, yeah, where you wear them, everyone's got a mask on, so you can't really identify me. Um, no, it wasn't me. It was him with the mask. Yeah, it was, uh, that's not me. Yeah. That bloke's got a mask on. I don't wear a mask. Yeah. Put, a, put a hood on, put your mask on, done. <laughs> that don't even look like Covered. my shotgun. My <laughs> shotgun's green. That one's black. <laughs> I always had this Ferrari. 
That was the Pedro and Banana Podcast. Find them wherever you find podcasts.